I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please remain standing for a moment of reflection for our servicemen and women throughout the world and for all those who died in the last week, particularly Patricia M. Cece, loving wife, mother, grandmother, and retired Scranton School District teacher, and her dear family and friends who suffer her loss. Roll call, please. Mr. McGough? Here. Mr. Rogan? Mr. Loscomb? Here. Mr. Joyce? Here. Mrs. Evans? Here. Dispense with the reading of the minutes, please. Third Order 3A. Minutes of the Composite Pension Board meeting held June 26, 2013. Are there any comments? If not, received and filed. 3B. Controller's report for the month ending June 30th, 2013. Are there any comments? If not, receive the file. 3C, addendum for the City Planning Commission meeting held July 24th, 2013. Are there any comments? If not, receive and file. Do we have any clerk's notes tonight, Mrs. Craig? No, Mrs. Evans. Thank you. Do any council members have announcements at this time? Scranton City Council will be in recess for the month of August and will resume regularly scheduled meetings on Thursday, September 5th, 2013. That's it. Mrs. Craig? Fourth order, citizens' participation. I don't have the uh, sign-in sheet. Our first speaker tonight is Gerard Hetman. Good evening, Council. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Gerard Hetman from Lackawanna County's Community Relations Department. To begin this evening, I would like to discuss some details of two new economic and community development initiatives that have recently been rolled out by the Lackawanna County Commissioners. I do have some handouts on these items. May I please approach? Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. To give you a snapshot of the two programs, uh, the first one on the top of your packet is known as the Lackawanna County Community Reinvest Program. To put it simple, the Reinvest Program is a grant program designed to invest some funds in what we term as quality of life projects uh, neighborhoods throughout Lackawanna County. Uh, examples of such projects could include parks and recreation development, uh, development of nature trails, walking trails, hiking trails, uh, building a community monument in your neighborhood, or any other project done by a municipality, a municipal authority, a school district, or any nonprofit community group within Lackawanna County. Again, this is an effort by the Lackawanna County Commissioners to invest in our neighborhoods to improve the quality of life for all of us. And I know from living in the city and from interacting with this gr these groups in the course of my job that there are many community groups, neighborhood watches, and lots of citizens who are interested in improving the quality of life in their neighborhoods in the city of Scranton. So we ask you to share this information with them if any of them are seeking to complete a specific project or have you know, a bright idea that may improve the neighborhoods where they live. The second item deals with private sector business development and creation. It's known as the Lackawanna County Land Development and Construction Fee Waiver Program. This is a program that's designed to assist businesses that are expanding or locating in Lackawanna County to help them out with some of the fees that are associated with permits and zoning and fees levied by municipalities. 
applicants that are successfully you know, sex, yeah, successful in applying to the program uh, would be eligible to have the county portion of those fees waived and to see the Lackawanna County Economic Development Department reimburse some or all of the fees levied by the municipality that the business is seeking to build uh, and or locate into. So it's a program that will assist the business making sure our local municipalities still receive the fees that they need to see the projects go through. Uh, so we know if, if you know of any businesses that may approach you seeking to expand their operations in Scranton or relocate to the city, please share this with them. Uh, we see this combined with the SBA fee loan waiver program that I introduced earlier this year on the previous meeting as a pretty powerful package that will show businesses that Lackawanna County and by extension the city of Scranton are open for business and that we welcome private sector development and job creation in our city and throughout the county. And then finally, just to go over a few community events coming up, um, all of which take place in the city of Scranton. Uh, this Saturday, July 27th, from noon to 8 p.m., we'll see the Arts on the Square event take place right on Courthouse Square in downtown Scranton. Arts on the Square is a community artisan marketplace and performing arts festival. Uh, we'll see over 40 vendors of various arts and crafts, artwork, uh, display their items for sale. Uh, there'll also be a full roster of performing artists comedians, musicians, theatrical performers. Uh, many of the downtown businesses are offering discounts on food, beverages, uh, sales for the day, and also I believe it's a $5 flat parking fee in any of the central parking administered garages. Uh, so it's a great event to really invigorate some life into downtown Scranton, um, and it's a really good time. Secondly, the uh, annual Lackawanna County 3-on-3 three -three basketball tournament returns again to the streets of downtown Scranton. Lots of folks asked us after the stadium renovations were completed, would this return to PNC Field? And the answer is we got so much good feedback on having it downtown last year, the organizers decided to keep it that way. Uh, registration is filling up, so anyone interested in entering a team, uh, we encourage them to visit lackawannacounty.org on the internet, and you can download an application form registration information right on the county homepage. And last but not least, the County Arts and Culture Department has our last Art in the Park <coughs> series event this coming Tuesday, July 30th at McDade Park in Scranton, right under the first pavilion when you pull in. From 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. at noon, there'll be free arts and crafts activities for children and accompanying adults. We'll also have some refreshments there as well. Uh, so there's a good lineup of events coming up this summer uh, in the next few weeks that uh, please let your neighbors and friends know, and uh, we hope that this contributes to the good quality of life in the city during the summer months. Uh, that's all we have for this evening, and uh, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Mr. Hetman, yes. is there a deadline for applications uh, for the reinvest? Um, it says, it, according program. to the manual, uh, it is a rolling application deadline. Uh, so there is no firm cutoff as to when uh, applications would need to be in by. Uh, Have you received any applications to date? Well, the program is administered by the Lackawanna County Economic Development Department, so they would be the ones to deal with the actual applications. Uh, but I can say that we have received a great deal of interest uh, from different municipalities and community groups uh, in Scranton, some of them, and other places in Lackawanna County. Uh, so the interest is very much there, but I can't speak for what has come in yet because we don't administer the program in our department. Thank you. I um, just have a quick question. I don't yeah. know if you can answer it. I may have to ask them. I, I didn't have a chance to look at it because it was sure. just presented to us, but mm -hmm. just opening the front page. Applicants are eligible for county grants for recreation and other community projects. The county monies may be used as a local match for state or federal grant applications. Applicants who have secured additional funding or will use the county monies to leverage additional funding will be given a high level of, higher level of priority. Mm -hmm. Is there a maximum amount? Uh, the, for this program? The funds allocated, I believe, in terms of the overall line item is $500,000. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Of course, we I don't think, we don't think we, that the whole thing will be granted to one applicant, but uh, you know, I would say that there's a, it'll be determined as applicants can commit. I don't think there's a limit on how much you could apply for, um, but I'll, I'll actually give you the information for contact info is right in the, the application, and I can follow up uh, with you or any other council member that may have additional questions, we can put you in touch with the Economic Development Department and they can help you fine tune any questions you may have. Sure. Right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Andy Spiraglia.
<coughs> Andy Sprague, yeah. Mrs. and fellow Scantonians. Good evening. A few words on the, the OYW. Uh, tell me, what did the historical society say about this project? I'm sure you went there being a historic building. Surely you must have went to the society and asked for their input on the project. Us went for the well. I assume you're voting on it. I would want had, all the we answers. Had a, we had a caucus here with the board, with the historical society. Oh, the, the hard board. No, the hard board is different than the historical. Oh, I, I apologize. Two different I didn't understand entities. what you were. One considers the history of the city. The other considers the architectural of the city. So I assume if you're going to tear down an historical building, you would go to the historical society and ask for their input. I mean, if you didn't do an input study on that, you're in the blind again. Maybe I understand the construction of it. I can understand them saying it's almost impossible to try to build over that building. But I don't know what, what point if you decide to have that building removed, what things you would want to keep for the history of that building, if it could be. But if you didn't get the study from the historical society, you're in the blind. I won't even, you, you might as well vote with bias. You would have to have a bias to vote for that without the historic society's input. It's just odd you didn't go. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bob Bolas. Good evening, Council. Bob Bolas, Granton. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Hate to be here again after being here last week and see what's been going on. It is disturbing to see how people look at things and how they believe who puts them in office. You know, everybody's complaining, geez, we have the unions here. We're having jobs. You know, we're definitely creating a job. It's a part-time job. When the brick and mortar is up, there is no more job. Where do they go? On unemployment? And hope somebody else comes around? These are temporary. We're not building a factory. We're not doing anything else. The people that the U employs to teach, to teach inside the building right where it is. The problem is we're influenced by those that we believe are in power when actually they're not. Because the voice of the people is a lot louder. It's just too bad they don't know how to speak up in this town. And they let the bullies keep slamming them around. I'm not against the U as a business. It's a great business. They pay a lot of money to their people. They build nice buildings. They all live out of the area for the most part. But what do they give us? Zero. That's what it is, zero. Just nice big round zero. Take a business course at the university. I'm sure everybody here has taken it or some that went to the U took it. What's the U teach you to do in a business course? It teaches you how to make money. That's the bottom line, how to make money. It teaches you how to not climb over the dollars to get at the pennies. To the contrary, the U teaches us to climb over the, do the pennies to get at the dollars, the almighty dollar. That's what makes them move. That allows them to spend millions and millions of dollars because they get it for free. And they don't give a darn thing back. They fill their coffers. They pay their educators. It's the students coming here that pay. You go to the gas pump, they raise the fees. They raise the price. You don't argue, you fill your car up with gas. Whether it's 10 cents today or a dollar. And when I sit here and I keep seeing how people sit here and say, we must have this almighty you. Go look at Mulberry Street. They're parking on Mulberry. You come down there. Cars are right by where there should be no cars. But it's the University of Scranton. They could do what they want to do. Because they're bullies. And they know they have the power. They control. You can look at Mr. McGough there. And I asked that he recuse himself last week. And I'll reiterate that again this week. He was a paid puppet. He worked there. Excuse me? 
And whether he likes it or not. He worked, I'm not excusing you, Mr. McGough. No. And I'm speaking, and you'll get your turn. No, you're not going to call no, me I'll names. tell you what, I, you're a paid puppet. You went to the university. You were on their payroll. And you speak on their behalf. That's unnecessary, You're a councilman, Mr. Mr. McGough, and you represent all the people. Keep that in mind, please. Let's go back. We're sick to, and tired let's of Let's go back to the topic, Mr. No, Evans. I am, Mrs. Evans, but I'm not going to sit here and think we're going to be belittled by people we put up here who not only spent the golf course money and made the kids swelter in the heat this year and the senior citizens because of the misconception they know what they're doing with money. You should have took the business course and maybe we'd have that money today and the interest to let the kids swim. And I hope one day, Mr. McGough, you understand what goes around comes around, that it's not about you. It's not about cronyism. It's about the people in this city. Where are the pay puppets from the university tonight? They're not here tonight. You know why? Because they got you in their pocket. They got their control, and you're going to do their bidding on behalf of them. And I hope tonight that some of the people here actually stand up for the people and take that smirk off your face and let you know that you shouldn't be voting for the you, you should be voting for the people. Put a boundary, make it a commercial area over there, and let them pay a tax. You pay taxes, you live in the city. Isn't it nice to see somebody getting a free ride at everybody's expenses? A city that disgraced itself nationally because you paid people minimum wage. You should be so darn proud of yourself that that happened. You should stand up and take a bow that what you did in past councils and past councils before you that put this city exactly where it is. You should have took the business course at the university, would have taught you what it is about making money and making something profitable and instead of putting the screws to the people. And I ask tonight, you leave this table and let the courts make the decision. It's not for people like McGough and other people here who think that the unions control us and it control you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Maybe you should have taken an ethics course, Mr. Wallace. Pardon? Maybe you should have taken an ethics course like I did. Mr. McGough, if you ever stand in the position I've stood in and get to the pinnacle in life that I've been, you can stand up and apply yourself. I never took a free ride. I paid my way. There's a difference. I never broke the law. I think, I and, think that's, excuse, that's excuse quite me, enough. Evans, I have and, one more thing. and the bar, I would remind counsel, is raised higher for us than it is for the speakers. Then you should have stopped them from making it personal. That was your fault. Well, it's, no, your fault, you're Mr. Right, McGough, because and, there's and a freedom of speech. And perhaps when the unions were calling people cavemen, I should have stopped that as well. Perhaps. Perhaps, that's right. Yeah, but I, excuse I'm me, sorry. Mr. Bullis, your time is up. No, your time, Mr. Bullis, your time is up. Your time is up, Mr. Bullis. Your time is up. <clears throat> Your time is up, Mr. Bullis. Thank you. And I know in the past there have been councils that I have been a part of, and I've been embarrassed by them because they have provoked the speakers who come to council. And that I will not tolerate. Mr. Miller? Good evening, Council. Doug Miller, Scranton. Uh, Good evening. You know, not to continue the contentious uh, atmosphere here, uh, but I have many questions myself uh, in relation to this university project. And, and before I go on, I do have to say that uh, at this point in time, I am, I am quite uh, fed up talking with this issue. I think this is something that should have uh, been resolved and it should have been defeated weeks ago. Um, my first question, though, is for Mr. McGough. Uh, Mr. McGough, why, why did you leave your vacation early today? Just curious. There was a rumor you were on vacation and you made a special trip back home. I was just wondering why you would have ended it so soon. It was a council meeting. Oh, is that the case? Okay. Um, no, there was just, the reason I asked, there was a rumor out there that uh, you didn't have any intentions on showing up tonight. Uh, you know, you made your determination on whether or not you were showing up. You had asked a certain councilman which way they, were, they would be voting this evening, and had the vote been in your favor, uh, you'd be here tonight. And, and if the vote was the other way, you made a comment that you weren't going to waste your time showing up. Um, I just think that's something that should be uh, clarified on the record for the public to uh, see this is the kind of leadership we have in the city where 
if votes don't go in our favor, and I know it's comical, and, and you know, you know, just uh, the disrespect by, by Mr. McGough just continues uh, week after week with the laughing and the snickering, and uh, you know, I just think it goes to show that this is just another case in point with Mr. McGough where it's political. Uh, also, word on the street is uh, I mean, one of the reasons that uh, Mr. McGough is in support of this project with the university is I've, I've, uh, I've heard rumors that uh, your grandson, uh, I don't know, will get scholarships to attend the university. Is that correct? Excuse me? Now I, I think you heard me. Now you're going to bring my family into this? This is what you're going to allow? These are, these are Mr. rumors Miller, I heard, Mr. McGough. Mr. Miller, uh, Mr. Things I'm Miller, asking you to clarify. Mr. Miller, I don't want anyone to engage in hearsay. Please. Oh, I'm not looking to engage. I just, uh, if, if Mr. McGough is so passionate, then perhaps you'd want to clear the air uh, so that there aren't these misconceptions. But evidently, it's, it's obviously true. Um, you excuse know, me? Oh, no, I'm not going to excuse you. Um, what is obviously true? You know, we listen to HARB, and we could see that it's quite dysfunctional. And we could see that, quite frankly, they're split. And had a revote been taken, it would have died 4 4. I think that needs to open our eyes, and I think we need to realize that this is something that should not happen. We, we've listened to the mouthpieces for the uni university come up here, and I think we need to know they're paid to come here and say that. They're paid puppets. Mr. McGough and Mr. Rogan have an obligation to represent the people. They want to talk about union jobs, they want to talk about licenses and permits, all one-time things. They're temporary jobs. Licenses and permits, we want to get excited over $400,000, that's lunch money to, for the university. When you take a look at the excess of millions of dollars they bring in every year. These are things we need to think about before we take votes. You know, we could laugh, we could snicker, but I think we know who's been bullied and who hasn't. And I, know we've, I think we know who's bought and paid for it. Obviously, it's Rogan and McGough, two individuals who have uh, not represented the residents of this city. And again, with the laughing and the snickering, you know, I come up here, I've been coming here for about 12 years now. I've gone through, this is my third council I've been coming before, and I've seen some pretty bad things go on. And a lot has changed since <coughs> this new council's taken over, for the better, thanks to Mrs. Evans, Mr. Joyce, and Mr. Laska. And I'm just asking the three of you to join together tonight and look out for the little guy, because that's what this is about. You weren't elected to represent the university. As we've said, they could build that building anywhere. Better yet, they could add their new structure to the existing uh, facility that's already there. I don't want to hear this, oh, it's inhabitable, it's not, it can't happen, it's not feasible. Please, the last person, the last group that should be talking about non-feasible is the University of Scranton. I mean, that's a complete joke. I mean, do you think we're stupid? But I, I'd say to Mr. Rogan and Mr. McGough, I quite frankly think it's a conflict of interest. I don't even think you should be voting on this issue. You both have ties to the university. How is it a conflict? And how, I don't think how you is it a conflict of interest, Mr. But Miller? But we need to look out for the residents of this city. Mr. And, Miller, how is know, my vote a conflict about of interest? and how they need to pay their fair share. Excuse me, this is my time. I'm you asking how I'm my done. vote's a conflict. You, you ask the question. You'll wait until I'm done. This is my time. You have your motions, I have my time. But the nonprofits in this city need to be held accountable. We've talked about how we need to place a fee on them once and for all, and put our foot down, and forget about asking them, because obviously that doesn't work. You know, they remind me of little schoolyard bullies. When they don't get their way on the playground, they take their ball home and they run home and go whine and cry to mommy and daddy because they didn't get what they want. Well, that could end tonight with three people on this council. Forget the other two, because we know where they're going. Okay, they're about themselves, and they've been that way from day one. But we have three people on this council that can put their foot down and do the right thing, and that's what I'm asking you to do tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Miller, uh, Mrs. Evans, if we could give him an extra 30 seconds, um, if he would like to address why he believes my vote would be a conflict. I'm giving you the opportunity. Thank you. Lee Morgan. Good evening, Council. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. I guess um, my comments, uh, since the council was split previously, I believe, 2 2, I guess probably, and I'm not trying to single you out, Mr. Joyce, but uh, you're the swing vote tonight. And uh, this is a very important vote for the residents of this city. I just, I lived adjacent to the University of Scranton as a child. I spent a lot of years on the Hill. I lived in Hill Hitchcock Court when I was a kid. I spent a lot of time there. I've watched the university grow. I know how they've grown. I remember the YWCA project when that building was given to the university. 
and I remember the renovations that were done to that building at that time. But I'm just hoping tonight, Mr. Joyce, and like I said, I'm not singling you out, but you're the vote here today because of the, the previous vote. I'm hoping tonight that you make a smart choice, and I hope that you vote no for this project. And, you know, I know I, it's not political to me, but, you know, I do understand that people run for public office and, and they get kind of, they want to be successful all the time. I just watched the university tear down the uh, former uh, house of detention. Just a beautiful building. I mean, where you couldn't find that building somewhere in this country again if you tried. Gargoyles on it. I mean, it was turn of the century mansion at one time, I assume. I've watched them take the whole hill. I've watched all the things they've done. I've watched the promises they've made and the promises that they've broken. And I just think that the University of Scranton has the ability to build that project anywhere they care to build that project. It doesn't have to be built right there. It can be built anywhere. The union, I understand where their perspective is. I'm a former Teamster. My um, great uncle was the president of the Carpenters Union at one time in this city. I have personally myself negotiated union contracts with companies I've worked for, but I'm a truck driver, just an ordinary person. But today, Mr. Joyce, you are the vote. And this, this project is not a benefit to this city because we're allowing this University of Scranton to build assets closer and closer to the center of town. This university is expanding out of control. And I think that tonight, by the vote this council takes, it will give this University of Scranton some leverage in court when they proceed there. And we need not give them that leverage. I just think it's important for once to say to the University of Scranton, look, I'm not going to call Mr. McGough names. I'm not going to call Mr. Rogan names. I think they're misguided, and I think their votes were wrong. But I respect them for the votes they've made. But I really think that this city needs to worry about other issues that are vastly more important in regards to the PEL and the next budget that's coming up. And I just think that we need to send a very strong signal to the University of Scranton that with all the massive assets that you have, you have to tear down a very historical building that has some very significant importance to this city. That's why that building went to them, because I think that the people that were caretaking that building gave it to the University of Scranton to protect it. And now the University of Scranton is done with it. And with the vast assets they have, it's of no consequence to them. And I understand the union. They want to put their people to work. And I understand that. And they can put them to work. But this project can be built somewhere else in the city and still be done and become a much better project because it will preserve our history and will allow the University of Scranton to build a very great building somewhere else. It's not like the university can't build somewhere else. They have vast land holdings in the city. They've just pinpointed this. And I just think that if the residents of this city could really understand why some of these votes take place and who votes for what for what reason, I think it would be eye-opening. But tonight, Mr. Joyce, look, at, I mean, I, don't, I know that I, I believe anyhow, I, don't, I haven't read it in the paper, but I believe you're still a candidate for the, for the tax office. And I just think that, you know, sometimes when you get elected to office, you have to take the tough stands. And you did that before with the budget. And you took a lot of heat for that. That probably hurt you in the last election on the Democratic side of the ballot. But you know what? You came forward. You did what you had to do. In my own opinion, I think the PEL and the administration has misled a lot of people about a lot of things. And now when this next budget comes up, you see where we're at. We're talking about massive tax increases. Even the court said that. So I'm asking you today to be a statesman, make the right choice, make the right decision, serve the residents of this city. Of course, let the university build this project somewhere else and preserve that structure for this city's history because we're losing a lot of our history. And I just think now is the time to save what little bit we have. And I think we need to really consider what kind of expansion the University of Scranton will try to accomplish in the center of our city if we don't stop their movement. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Ron Elman. Hello, my friends. I say that because I'm not mad at nobody tonight up there. I wish I could speak like Lee or Andy and some of the others, but I can't. 
So I'll, I'll try to read this, but I, I, I say these things from my heart because I love this city. And it's, it's just going the wrong way. Today there was, you'll see it on the news if you get home, there was hundreds of people at the Peckville Assembly of God for a food giveaway. They said over 2,000 people. These are the very people that will be so affected by a, a, a double our tax increase in, in rents. In, in, it just takes so much to live these days. It's, it's, I, don't, I don't know what you're supposed to do, but this, it, it, it's impossible to double everything right now in this city. It's, it, it just, the city's not going to survive like that. This would be the coup de grace. I talked to some people out there today. I took someone out there. I talked to six or eight people out there. <laughs> Let me t there was two ladies next to me in a new Mercedes. I don't know what they were doing there. You know, I guess it's the, they're they're right, but uh, <laughs> I, I, I didn't talk to them because they got me mad. But Mr. Cross needs to come down from this ivory tower he's in because this city is not in good shape. I was at the mall to pay my son's uh, cable bill. There was 14 people sitting in the, in the big room in the back at the tables. Two of them were eating, three guys were drinking coffee, and the rest of the people, there's a couple of them that brought their lunch, they were just sitting there. That mall not going to survive like that. It's almost empty. There's just no people go there for some reason. It, you know, I don't, I don't know what the trouble is. But it, this tax base just keeps going back to the university. It, it, they're destroying our city house by house and street by street. It, it, they've got to be stopped. You know, we're, we're at a fork right now in the road. We're either going to let the city demands rule us or we're going to have to get a mayor that's going to confront them and put an end to it. Uh, I know you're not going to like this, but the, these greedy Jesuits, they have forgotten one thing. They're, they too are under God's never sleeping eye. You know, they, they, they just, they, you know, it's like last week. If you go against them, they just can't believe it. You know, they just, what in the world is wrong with this council? They're going against me. What is wrong with the people of the city? They're not agreeing with us. The first thing that comes to their mind is to sue everybody. You know, why don't they just hire their own police and their own fire and pay for all their own electricity? I'm paying for it. These people are paying for it. It doesn't make sense to me. They're not doing nothing. They talk about generating $400 million. It hasn't lowered no one's taxes. You know, the, the supporters that, that stay in, in the newspaper and protest so strongly for the university and this assorted company of self-serving politicians like Mr. Blake, he just solely supports them. And there's a bunch of plain blind fools that, that write the paper continuously supporting them. And, and they don't have facts and figures or nothing right. They don't, they just don't know what's happening Yesterday, the day before, Morgan wrote a letter that we could make all our finances on the building permits. He has no idea how that works. I mean, there's just a, it's not much money to start with, then all these developers and people beat us out of the little bit that we're supposed to be getting. You know how it works up there? There's a, there's a, there's a schedule, I guess you call it, for, for building permits. It's not a lot of money involved. 
Well, I, I hope council uh, can do the right thing for the people. Like I said, 2,000 people out there, they're the ones that need the help, and, and they're not getting it from anyone except churches like that. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. That concludes our sign-in sheet for this evening. Is there anyone else who cares to address council? Good evening, council. Dave Dobson. Good evening. President Good evening. Scranton. Good evening. Uh, a few weeks ago, and I'm going to mention it one more time about a letter uh, on Steamtown to restore some appropriations. The reason I'm, I'm asking is because August is typically your month for the federal government to uh, consider finances. So uh, they really need it. They've been reduced about mm, 1.3 million out of 5.2 million, and it's never been raised from 1992. So. Uh, as you could see, with the way prices have increased and everything else, uh, uh, and then because it was never increased, they get the cut too, along with uh, people that maybe went from uh, 400 million or 400 billion dollars to uh, six or 700 billion, like the Defense Department. By the way, uh, last week I mentioned about that, and the contractors aren't getting the cuts; it's the people that are on the ships get to lay in their beds and be quiet and not be paid for the day. Uh, now, I have a question. The court case on this, uh, would that also include the demolition as opposed to the zoning board uh, with the university? Uh, perhaps we could ask that of our solicitor. I would think not. Uh-huh. But... Okay. Uh, Solicitor Hughes? No, that's strictly a zoning appeal. Right. So, so that has nothing so it, to do with the demolition. So it's totally separate. Totally separate. It's fallen in your laps. And I sympathize with everybody up there because there's two arguments to be made. And one is that it's a historical building. We've heard that. And the other is that a lot of us would like to see it stay within the tax-free zone. It's been tax-free for a hundred years or so. It housed the uh, Lackawanna College at one time. And as much as I like to be of help to everybody or support one side or the other, I'm kind of in between on that. And uh, some of the outside articles, like uh, what was just mentioned, uh, Mr. Oliver Morgan, uh, he uses statements like, do you were to double or triple its payment in lieu of taxes? Well, I'm glad I didn't pay for any education from him with language like that, excuse me, <laughs> on a lighter note. Uh, and I would also like to mention that there's a lot of other institutions, I pointed them out last week, uh, government entities like the county trying to buy buildings downtown, they're going to go tax for tax exempt. And that's not helping us. Uh, I don't, I, I can't in my right mind how, know how anybody could sit with a straight face and raise somebody's taxes 100% and when in realizing that 30 to 60% of the people that have become reemployed since the last recession have been reemployed for 30% less. And 30% of all of the people that are like around 60 years old are draining their retirement accounts on the lower echelons of our society. So they're actually withdrawing money from their retirement accounts to make ends meet. And uh, what they should be doing is saving it, and they can't because they have mortgages or whatever. Uh, now, it's, uh, there was an article on delinquent trash fees. I put a question on that. And 
I'd just like to remind everybody, let's put our thinking caps on because it's $7.8 million was the figure. And it's, it's a real shame because it was probably, and what NCC used to treat these delinquent accounts like an investment. They, they could have told me months before and then they piled a bunch of other stuff that got missed in my closing. And they actually treated it like an investment because they could attach more fees. Mm -hmm. And they collected another hundred, hundred and a quarter, or whatever out of my pocket. Uh, I was standing right there, they had a computer screen right there, my name right there, and they just sat there with their tongue in their cheek and I paid taxes on another purchase of a, a lot within the city that I, I bought. And uh, uh, they, they were mum on it. And uh, I also had a question a week or two ago about the union settlement and that became obvious today. Uh, there is going to be, if it goes up to 70%, uh, there is going to be some problems with it. And furthermore, I, I'll make it quick. On this economic development promises, uh, I don't see where somebody that's struggling to pay for their schooling is really going to. So those arguments are a little lame. I, I don't see them down at some tavern spending 75 bucks on a Saturday night out. That's all there is to it. Uh, you know, I see a coffee shop that seems to have a lot of university people in it. I've been there. And uh, uh, I don't really frequent many bars downtown because I can't drink anymore. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you, and, Mr. Dobson. Okay. Uh, in, uh, I'll make it real quick. In Virginia, uh, Cucinelli, uh, Ken Cucinelli wants to outlaw most married uh, heterosexual practices, make it a one-year felony. I guess Virginia isn't for lovers anymore. Bach, bach, bach. That's a good uh, argument for secularism now, secularism then, and secularism forever to steal from old George Wallace. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Council. Good, e um, good evening. Uh, two quick things that I would like to uh, have answered tonight. Uh, one is the status of the BRT ICE payment of $600,000 that's in the budget for this year and uh, when we might receive that. And um, several weeks ago, I think it was June 27th, Mr. Laskam, you spoke about the uh, that you'd had a report that a police officer was doing work that should have required a permit on Rundle Avenue and had no permit. I just wondered what the uh, what the outcome of that was as well. Maybe during during fifth order, okay. or if I finish, because I really don't have that much to say tonight. I I think I know where this is going, but I think Andy Spragley hit this nail on the head last week. The YWCA was the Ellis Island of northeastern Pennsylvania. Uh, many of you, maybe you're just too, too young to, re to even know. Um, I, I think those of us who can still appreciate it and look around the city, as I said the very first night this came up, and, and look at the tributes to women, nothing, nothing. And we have one, one item and I fear that you people will cave and, and give in again, which leads me to the point that I want to reiterate, which is that this onesies has got to stop. You cannot keep the university from buying properties. Uh, Mr. Rogan's, oh yeah, once, you know, well, it's off the tax rolls anyway, so it doesn't matter what they do with it. So this is just gonna be a onesie, 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 and it's just gonna eat away and what you really need to do, somebody, the administration and you, I believe, need to sit down with the university and see what their plans are. Obviously, they are going, they're expanding. You know, that's a good thing maybe. But it's not within their institutional zone. 
and maybe they need a satellite campus someplace else in the city or maybe on other properties that they hold. Um, I would also remind you of Scranton Central High School. Now, and most of you I know are from West Scranton, but uh, I remember Central High School. I was very upset. I wasn't living here, but I was following things closely, and man, it was a dump. It was, there was nothing you could do with it. It was a dump until that deed transferred, mm -hmm. and then it was a magnificent structure. And I can't even go through to this day. I cannot complete a tour of that building. It just makes me sick because you go in there and they, oh, we've got this fresco is just one of eight in the in the country or the world and this and look at these marble steps and look yada yada yada. Now all of a sudden it's wonderful. And I would suggest the same may be true of the YWCA. Buildings were built well in 1907. And if the university, I mean, why don't they go up on their own old um, science building? They've got a brand new science building. Um, so I think there are, other, there are other options. I think people need to, uh, you know, consider somebody other than the unions. I will speak a little bit about the unions. You know, I do find it somewhat aggravating that the only time the union people seem to show up, especially the you know, the carpenters, electrical, uh, the non-city non unions, is when they want something. They want jobs. Well, fine. A lot of people want jobs. But look at around the city. Look at all the buildings that are pretty much dilapidated and didn't have to be that way. If, I mean, the unions have big pension funds. They loaned us money. I mean, that was a different union, but they all have big funds. So why don't they invest some of this money if, and rehab these homes and then take the profit as their pay? You know, that what, what do they do for the city except come with, the, with their tin cup? And how many, I would like, if you do pass this, I would like a requirement that the university must provide the addresses of the workers that they, the union workers that they hire, and I'll bet you very few of them will be from Scranton. And finally, uh, last week, Mr. Joyce, you had the, uh, this legislation that will set a precedent of removing a historically designated building. Um, so the burden, I guess, may be on your shoulders. I don't know if it's still 2-2, and you may be the tiebreaker. But I would like you to share, with the time that I have left, how you did the research on the historical significance, where you went, who you talked to. Maybe in fifth order. Thank you. I, I'm very interested in that. Thank you. Um, if I might, before I call for any additional speakers, you touched on um, an issue that really jogged my memory, that being Central High School. At the time, I was a Scranton school director, oh. and one of nine, and one of two to vote against the sale of Central High School. Well, thank you. And uh, I realized what a magnificent gem it was and how truly irreplaceable it was and continues to be. Um, the school district at the time felt that a renovation was completely unaffordable. And in its place, it constructed a $60 million, in my opinion, and I'm sure there are many who will disagree with me, but in my opinion, a monstrosity off Olive Street that resembles something that is out of Gotham City and Batman. And that was, for whatever reason, far more affordable to the school district than renovating Central High School, which was done for less funding by Lackawanna Junior College. And it's, you know, I'm certainly glad that it was put to um, a beneficial use, but certainly oh, the school I. district should have and could have held on to that building and renovated it. But stranger things have happened. And I think what ties all this in is that the architect uh, who designed the YWCA building 
I believe was also part of a team of architects at the time from New York City who designed Central High School mm -hmm. and the Scranton State School for the Deaf. And he left New York and that firm and came to live in Scranton and he was the architect. He was the premier architect at the time in the city of Scranton. Mm -hmm. And he designed the Catlin House, I believe uh, the Scranton Club, the Scranton Electric Building, the, uh, well, as we said, the YWCA, among others. And these are our historical treasures. They are the memory of a city that is left for future generations because our oh, memories, you know, I, I have my own memories as a young girl, probably from first grade through eighth grade. My parents sent me to the Y every Saturday, and that's where I learned to swim, sew, knit, crochet, roller skate. <laughs> uh, and certainly, I have those memories. My children don't have those memories. Um, I don't know if the young people of the city have those memories, and certainly the future generations, there will be no memory. That's it will be forever gone because you and I, we're not going to live forever. And that building, it's a shame, oh, shouldn't be not. placed in such a position that yeah. it's only a memory for those of us uh, who were around at the time. And if, if I may just add one, one other item, I think maybe we need to, you all need to talk to the, the HARB as well. Uh, we have these structures and they're on a list up in Lips and I don't even know if they're in Albright, I didn't check, but they need to do something to refresh people's memories and to connect the current generation with the past and what all of these buildings, not just the Y, but all of these buildings have meant to the city and, and certainly, as I say, I'm very passionate about the Y. I'm making a list and I'm checking it twice and um, uh, I we'll think cast I th future votes and I think you would agree too that um, historic preservation, renovation of the building, is true sustainable economic development, and the replacements for that don't they fall don't into exist. the same Look category. At, They're not going to be sustainable through the years. No, and and even you know if I look some of these buildings that are being uh, worked on now. There, there are young buildings and yet they need all this work to bring them up and if anything should win the hearts is looking at that picture that was in the in the paper with what it does to Elm Park Church take away their sunshine who cares look at this generation and that generation but you know thank you thank you thank you is there anyone else who cares to address council Once again, my name is Jack Figured. I live at 417 Leggett Street, and I am with the Bricklayers International or Union for Allied Craft Workers. When I just can't imagine how it, it, this could be such a polarized issue, and how we got to this point. It, it just seems to me that I've, I've listened to a number of speakers over the last five weeks. I've seen the university's viewpoint. I see where they own the property. They have a building that doesn't meet their needs. They have, they want to go forward and put and build something that's actually going to complement another building at the site. I, I hear about how it's going to impact the citizens of the city of Scranton if we tear this building down. I, what what is the impact to the citizens of Scranton? We have a building there, an older building, that can't be renovated to the needs of the university. Can it be re renovated to anything else? Yes. Who has the money to buy this building? Is Scranton going to buy this building off the university? Do they have the money to go forward with a project like that? You know, I, I, just, I just don't understand. And, and the impact on the people in the city of Scranton? Yes. I represent the bricklayers and LA craft workers, which happen to be union craftsmen. 
But there's nothing to say that we're going to get this job. This is all done through competitive bidding. There'll be people from all walks of life that work on this city. And Marie, you can laugh and say, but let me tell you something. You walked up the steps this morning that we put in for the city count. We put in for the city 25 years ago for free with the flower boxes. Elm Park Church, I worked on that church for free. I did a number of things for this community to make sure that those people that I represent have a shot to work here. The little people, they're the people that are working three months out of the year, four months out of the year because of this economic downturn. They're losing their houses, they're losing their insurance, they're losing their families. All of us are going through it, whether you're union or non-union. These are tough economic times. This building doesn't suit the need of the owner. What happens if we don't go forward? Attorney, Attorney Hughes, is this something that, we can win, that you would take the litigation and, and fight the university on? Is it worth it? You're looking at $400,000 in building permits and other fees? Let me ask you another question. Where does the money come from? Are, are we going to just burn that money up that's for something that's going to be done? When did common sense go out the window? When did we stop representing all the people in the city of Scranton? Everybody's had their opportunity to come to this forum and speak on this. We've all spoken. Some say that the university is expanding beyond its boundaries. The university's taking a building that they own and they're gonna build upward. That's no expansion. What they'll do in the future, I don't know, okay? Some think it could be moved to another section. Well, where to another section? Some, some, some speakers complain that you're already tearing out enough residences in the city and eating up enough residences. Do some of those speakers, would they be happier if it was built on another property where they did take more residences? I don't understand it. This is a very polarized issue. It's something that the council has to look to themselves and decide what they're gonna do here for everyone in the city of Scranton. Not, the, not just the union people, yes, do I represent them? Absolutely. Mrs. Evans, sorry I made that comment at the first meeting. If you take offense to that, I quoted somebody that I really look up to, Butch Shilmafinnick. He sat down at many a table and worked out many a deal. He did many good things for this city. He told me, you can't please everybody. I just repeated what I heard. Uh, so if this, I don't even see it actually on the agenda. Hopefully it will come up. Hopefully it, we'll, it will come up. Hopefully we'll put this to bed tonight. All right. Uh, I, I just don't know why we're so polarized over, over something at, of this matter. We're looking at a building who, who, who in its heyday was 100 years ago. That's great. A lot of fond memories. I remember when there was a pool on every, plague, on every block in the city, and there was a building there that the city owned, and we all, when we were kids, we all did all these wonderful things there and swam. That's not the case anymore. The finances don't have, we don't have the finances for it. But we do need to go forward on these projects. If anybody ha can tell me what the adverse effects, effects of the city of Scranton are, on the, on the people that live here, come forward and have your say. Um, I'd just like to comment briefly on that. Uh, Mr. Figured, I, I honestly can't imagine why you favor demolition rather than lobbying for... You can be seated, please. Okay. Rather than lobbying for renovation, because as a rule of thumb, new construction will be half materials and half labor. Rehabilitation, on the other hand, will be 60 to 70 percent labor and the remainder materials. A million dollars spent in new construction generates 30.5 jobs. That same million dollars in the rehabilitation of an historic building generates 35.4 jobs. If jobs are truly your priority, I would think you'd be looking for as many jobs for your membership as could be provided, and that would come through lobbying for renovation of that building. But 
but it doesn't meet the needs of the owner. So if they don't go forward with a new building there, adjacent to the building that they have there, which will complement it, what do they do with it? Do, does the city buy it? Who, who's going to buy this building and renovate it? I don't see people beating the doors down in the city of Scranton to do this. All right? Well, I think the university is capable of financially renovating it. Thank you. Is there anyone else? Mrs. Evans, may I have a point of interest for a moment? Yes. Thank you. I'd like to let everyone know that you did direct me to put that on the table and mark it as previously tabled. And it was a miscommunication in our office and my fault that it did not show up on the agenda. It is, however, in council's guide sheet for everyone to know. So I'd just like the audience and everyone at home to know that. Thank you, Mrs. Craig. Bye, Chris. Chrissy, no hat tonight. Hey, Jack. Over the Wednesday, you next Wednesday. That's right. We, Chris wants everybody to know Wednesday. Next, next Wednesday, next Wednesday at seven thirty, the Dream oh, Game. Oh no, eight o'clock, Jack. Eight o'clock. I got everybody Jack, show up. You, one question for you only. They can rock the lid to be laid up. Nick Manosis. It's all. Then we checked up for three weeks up there. You have we to called, show me. Called. No one, no one can watch it to late. Thanks, Jack. All right, buddy. Thanks, Thank Chrissy. You. Greg Hulls, uh, West Side resident and Good taxpayer. Evening. Good evening. Good evening. Um, before, I, I've been thinking about this for weeks, and uh, I just have a few questions. Uh, one is like, we, we they, I keep hearing four hundred, five hundred thousand dollars for permits. Well, I am. My understanding is that's a one-time deal. What's the long-term? What's the long-term goal? Or what's the long-term uh, plan? You know, um, two. Um, I heard someone say that the, this building is going to be out of the university academic zone or tax-free zone or whatever. Um, can we tax that then? Like, at a, like not at the full three and a, three and a half or three point four percent, but can we go like one point seven or or two percent? It's something. It, it would be a compromise with the with the university and the city. <coughs> um, although I, I do agree, it, it provides lots or a few um, good construction jobs aren't they in reality just temporary I mean I, I'm all for union I'm a union member myself but I would want to see union jobs more long term not a year what is it, a year six months a year maybe two um, you know I, I want to see jobs and I want to see good union jobs come in one more thing, uh, people, I haven't heard anyone talk about this, but what about the janitorial staff or the maid staff that's going to be facil facil uh, facilitating this building? Could they be unionized? Can we demand that they're unionized? Can we, that they get more than, a, than just a minimum wage? Uh, they're going to need people to staff that building. Uh, I just read an article in the New York Times today how uh, they were talking about how Scranton was on the, among the top to get uh, to, to for for poor people to get in the middle class. Uh, if you haven't seen that article, it's in the New York Times today. You might want to take a look at it. It's really a great read. And four, um, shouldn't the city and council be working on more long-term goals, supporting mom and pop businesses, and not big corporations that I consider the university is? They're owning. They're buying everything. Uh, and you know they are tax exempt, but there's got to be a solution. There's got to be a solution on how we can get around it, or they can pay their fair share. Because not not to demean their donations to the city, but it's a joke. It's a joke. I'm sure it helps lots of people, but it's a joke because it's not even comparable what they would be paying if it was if they were taxed at the normal corporation rate or whatever. It, I'm glad they're, they're, they do it. But they do it because it's a PR move, plain and simple. They look good. They know they're not paying taxes. They look good to the city. That's just my opinion. That's the way I feel about it. So, um, and one more, one more thing. Uh, I just hope we get a long-term goal, not nothing short-term, nothing quick and easy, like anything is anymore these days. But I'd like to see more uh, emphasis on long-term goals because that's what the city needs. And frankly, I don't think that's what this council or past councils have, or, or even mayors, 
have done in the past is that they look for the quick patch, uh, fix me up, and, or band-aid approach. I'd like to see more long-term solutions being played. And one more thing I wanna, uh, just want to add, Mr. Rogan, Mr. McGough, I'm ashamed about how you guys were treated, even though I don't agree with you on a lot of things. I, I am ashamed by the other people bringing your family in and accusing you of, of not always going with the people. It, at least you made a vote, a public vote, that's the way you stand. I, I, I could respect that. I don't have to hate you for it. All right, so thank you very much for your time and good luck. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just quickly, I would say that um, though the university expands outside its institutional zone, that does not necessarily grant a municipality the ability to tax them because they are a tax exempt institution. However, municipalities. Uh, can go after property taxes on property owned by nonprofits that are not used for tax exempt purposes or for their stated, for example, educational mission. Uh, they can also be paying um, uh, additional taxes, for example, such as uh, the city's parking tax. Is there anyone else? Dave Ferranis, Scranton. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Well, I respect people's votes when I think they're doing it from their heart and they're really considering the best for the people. But what I see appears a council of politicians and public servants. Jack Loscombe, Janet Evans, public servants. Frank Joyce, Bob McGough, Pat Rogan, politicians. <coughs> Mr. Joyce, is it true that Mr. McGough asked you to call him if you were going to vote for this demolition? Otherwise, he wouldn't come in from the Yes, vacation? I did. I asked you, Frank. Yes, he, he did. So that more or less tells me he's here, so that means you must be going to vote for this. And you've been telling me for weeks now that the reason you're voting for this is because it's for the best interest of the people. Well, to me that's hogwash. I've gotten, I've gotten many phone calls from union members, because I'm a member of a union. And they've told me that the deal is in. That the reason that you will vote for this is because you've got their votes for the tax collector's job in November. So to me, that tells me you're going to tell the people tonight that you're doing it for permit money, for financial, for the city. To me, that's a big phony baloney. It's completely not true. You're doing this to get votes from the union. And the union man who spoke before said last week, you people, which I hate that reference, you people, you come to us when election time comes, meaning you want their votes. Well, the deal's in. You will get their votes. But don't forget, the union's only this big part of the city because half of them are out of town. So all the residents, 70,000 people in this city, will see you for what you are tonight when you vote. And if you vote for this, they will know why you're doing it, to get votes. So you sold your soul for votes. I never in my life thought that you would ever do it. Never. But that's fine. Because to me, that means your political future is over with that vote. Mr. Rogan, is it not true that you're a student at the university for many years now and right now are a student? I've attended the university. Are you there? Are you a student now? Yeah, actually I am. And you don't think that's a conflict of interest? No, I pay my tuition and I'll be paying no, for many years to come. I know that, but you're partial to a university of Scranton. You're a student there. That's up for the people to decide. Like I said, you're politicians. Mr. McGough is a politician. Mr. Joyce is a politician. Mrs. Evans and Mr. Loskin are public servants because they're looking out for the best interest of the people. And Mr. Joyce, your vote, if you vote that way, you're going to set a president that this city may never, ever come because every historical building may get torn down because of your vote. But you don't care. 
because you might get votes from the union. And the union people, they come here, greed, 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 University of Scranton, greed, greed, greed. Do you see them when they, you ever see them come here and talk for the benefit of the people? Only for themselves. They're pleading a case for themselves to line their pockets. Why can't they come all the other times and, and try to help the people? You don't hear that. They're taking care of themselves, just like you, Mr. Joyce, taking care of yourself. So I hope the people hear me and wait out and think of what they want. I don't think I've been off base at all for many years. And I think there's a lot of crap going on here. And I think there's a lot of deals. And the vote will show it tonight. And, and how you can sleep is beyond me. But I give Mr. Loskin and Mrs. Evans all the credit in the world. They get blasted in the paper, but you know what? They're honest. And when you do the right thing, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what anybody says about you because you're doing the right thing. What is that, Mrs. Evans? Maybe you know what the saying is, in for a penny, in for a pound. Mm -hmm. You ever hear that expression, in for a penny, in for a pound? No. Oh, well. Okay, I think it means, for example, Mr. Joyce, you're, you're getting the vote, so keep going. I can't explain it, but it's just a horrible thing that you're doing. And I will be reminding the taxpayers in the city of Scranton, everybody, from this day forward at every council meeting, if this takes place tonight, who are the real people that are for the people and who are the ones that are in it for themselves? And I will remind them week after week after week because it makes a difference. Because if this is the case, Mr. Joyce, and you do vote for this, how could we trust you as a tax collector? You will be just like the past tax collectors. So that's my opinion. Thank you, Thank Mrs. You. Franis. Is there I would else? like to state just for the record that I did not speak personally to any of the trade union individuals here over the phone after the meeting or in any private session, and there were no deals that I made. I don't even know the union leaders of the trades. I don't know if they voted for me. I don't know if they will vote for me in the future. So I did not make any deal whatsoever. That's all. Is there anyone else who cares to address council? Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. I'm Good Kathy evening. Kavanaugh, and I am a homeowner in Scranton and a taxpayer. And I would also like to add that I am Frank Joyce's aunt, so that nothing could be said afterwards that I said this or that because of it. I'm also a friend of Jackie Loscombe's for what, Jackie? 35 years, 40? And of keep, course, keep Janet Evans and Pat, and I don't know Mr. McGough very well, but I did not plan on coming up here and to speak. I kind of was here for a little bit of moral support from my nephew. However, I am so furious over some of the things that have been said here tonight, but particularly over the things that have been said by the speaker who have come up here last. To say that my nephew has made deals for his vote is so offensive that she should, I don't know how she can look herself in the mirror. I am going to say a few things. Well, first of all, Frankie has gotten threatening emails. And I've seen them, and they are from people in the audience. They're not from the university, and they are not from the tradespeople. Who, by the way, Frankie does not know any, any of the tradespeople in this audience. I told him maybe he should sit, share some of those emails, just so people would know where other people that have come up here and spoken are coming from. That person is the bully, not the university in this case. And it had nothing to do with votes. In fact, one of the vote, one of the emails 
was threatening him because how dare he go against Mrs. Evans. Mrs. Evans is a very good friend of my nephew's. And if there's one thing that she has always said and always been in favor of is vote your conscience. Vote for what you feel is the best. Most of the time it's exactly what Mrs. Evans feels is right. And other times it isn't. When this council began, it began on that premise so that it would not be like previous councils and just little ducks following each other. And the people that come here were glad that it was that way. So how dare now people insult my nephew for not doing the very same thing that put this city in the position that it's in. Now, this might be a little, uh, how do you put it, um, scramble because I was sitting writing down comments. And now I'll address that. The fact is, when Frankie came last week, he had full intention of voting yes. After he heard what Harb went on about, he asked to table the meeting, and it wasn't a popular thing. But that in itself shows that he had an open mind, that he was concerned, so he wanted to go back and rethink it. That right there tells you that he is not being influenced by anybody except his own conscience, that he wanted to think it out. So whatever decision he makes tonight is a decision that he himself sat and thought about. And that's what they're coming up and saying. You're a councilman. Be a statesman. You're serving all of Scranton. Not just the people that come here every week. And I'll mention another thing. Why aren't the unions here every week? They only come when they want something. This is the first time I've been here, and I actually have come because of Frankie. But let me tell you something. I have been involved in politics long before I could vote, and I dare say that I have done more in the political arena than probably half the people in this room has done. I am certainly more, I'm not only interested in city council, I've been involved in state and federal politics. So it's not right for anyone to say, if somebody isn't here every week, they don't care. They're just not here. It doesn't mean they don't care. And as far as him worrying about the union votes, this gentleman come up and said there's maybe two, three hundred of them. You think that's going to push anybody over? in an election. And I just want to just say one last thing. Well, actually, two. They say that the University of Scranton is evil, it's a villain, it's everything. That's not what you're voting on. Just sit and listen to what you're saying, what you said when you come up here. You're voting on a demolition of an historic thing. That's it. You're not voting on, they're not on trial here. No, I'm, I'm embarrassed for them. I graduated from the University of Scranton. I paid 10 years on my student loans. My daughter graduated from there. Should I not be allowed to come up and say anything because I went to the, should I excuse myself from my opinion? Of course not. Those insults over there from Mr. McGough and, and um, Mr. Rogan, ridiculous. And you know what? As far as Harb is concerned, that was a real vote. Somebody didn't come. Mr. McGough came from his vacation. That's something to ridicule him for? No. He wanted to get here so he could vote and make sure the vote went in the way he felt it should be. As far as the university is concerned, they should be, they should be donating money. But them being evil? Exactly what do you think would be sitting there in all that area that the University of Scranton has taken up? 
We can't get the rest of the people in Scranton to pay their taxes. Thank you, Ms. Kavanaugh. Well, thank you. Sorry, I started to ramble on, but that's okay. Is there anyone else? Mrs. Craig? 5A motion. <clears throat> Councilman McGough, do you have any comments or motions? Yes, thank you. Um, first, I'd just like to say that uh, I believe it's a sad commentary that um, disagreement over a, a vote needs to become personal for some people. Um, and, and not only personal, but that family members uh, you know, need to be brought into it. Um, my grandson never even applied to the University of Scranton. He attended Albright College last year and will now attend King's College the coming year. And to say that, to even imply that he somehow would receive something inappropriately or unethically it is an insult to a great young man. He has earned everything that he has received. This is a young man that's an honor student, voted most outstanding senior, is graduating class, captain of two athletic teams, and I really do take it personally when someone attacks him. There is absolutely no reason to do that. He has earned everything that he has received and more. And I'm insulted that somebody would even indicate that he would do other, otherwise. As far as the personal um, attacks bought and paid for, I challenge anyone, anyone, to tell me something that I received inappropriately, anything. I've been on this council for seven years. I have received nothing in return for my service here other than the salary that we receive. I believe it's slanderous to indicate otherwise. I, yes, I attended the University of Scranton. I received my master's degree from the University of Scranton. It took me 10 years and I paid every cent of that tuition. I received nothing from them other than the piece of paper saying that I had a master's degree. And I'm proud of that. Yes, I did work for the University of Scranton as a coach and an adjunct professor. And believe me, the salary that I received for the hours that I put in did not do much to compensate for what I did. And yes, I'm proud to have worked there. I enjoyed working there. It's been a long time since I've worked there. And also, when, when somebody indicates that or implies that I am voting for something for some other reason other than I believe it's the right thing to do, I just want to remind that I was elected to this position twice. I received over 7,000 votes in the last election. Apparently, somebody believes that what I'm doing is correct and that I represent the interest of the people. And yes, the, the last thing that was, um, I drove 11 hours today uh, from North Carolina to Scranton so that I could be here. And yes, I did call, or did ask Mr. Joyce, I, I was rather upset last week and I probably said some things to Mr. Joyce that I shouldn't. But 
In the end, I did ask him if he would call me and let me know how he, was, he thought he would vote. Um, when we left here and uh, we left the next day for the vacation, it was determined by then. My wife and I determined that I would return for this vote, for this, for this meeting. There was no coercion from anybody or anything for me to return. I believe that that was my duty to come and represent the people that elected me and to vote in an appropriate in the way in which I felt was appropriate and again um, to indicate that I somehow received something in return for this I find very insulting um, there is no evidence there is no precedent for anyone to make that statement about me I believe this project is important to the city and I'll speak more on it when we actually get to the vote. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McGough. And Councilman Rogan, do you have comments or motions? Yes, just <coughs> excuse me, just a few comments and, and I'll also speak more on um, the issue of the night when it when it comes time for the vote. I, I think what we've seen at this meeting and for the last month on this issue is the people who oppose this project are trying to distract not only council but the public listen to what the speakers have said with the exception of Ms. Schumacher and one or two other speakers who have talked about the actual issue at hand tonight we've had personal attacks on Mr. McGough, on myself, on Mr. Joyce and none of that is appropriate if somebody comes up and disagrees with myself or one of my colleagues on an issue that's why we're here. People could come to that podium and agree with us, disagree with us, state why they do, state what you know, where they stand, and that's what this body is here for. But for personal attacks to get involved in it when people's family members are getting involved, um, I, I think that's completely out of line. Getting back to what I was saying with this just being a distraction, the opponents of the project, for the most part, with one or two exceptions, have not even spoke about the project tonight. They have spent all their time attacking Mr. McGough, myself, Mr. Joyce, the university. And there are, I have issues with the university. I, I'm sure people don't agree with each one of us on every one of our votes. And we vote on hundreds of items a year. We wouldn't expect two people to agree 100% of the time. But just the fact that the opposition is completely changing the discussion means they know they're wrong. It's a losing battle. With Ms. Ms. Schumacher, I said with the exception of you and one or two others who spoke on the issue. The issue at hand is should council approve the demolition of this building that was approved by heart. That's the issue. And we all could come to our own conclusions on how to get to that answer whether we believe that the job creation and the money brought to the city trumps the historical significance or vice versa. That's the issue. And each one of us on council has to make that decision on their own. Not based off of uh, an attack on a family member or an attack on a council member or allegations of this or that. We each get to make our decision. And it should be based on what they firmly believe. I'll talk more on this issue when it, when it comes time for a vote, but I, I really am upset with a lot of what transpired tonight. I, I love to debate. I love to speak about the issues. There are many times when <laughs> I think myself and others have dragged the meetings on for much longer than normally they should have been because we were discussing the issues, and that, that's great. That's what democracy is about. But it, the personal attacks should not, do not belong in this body and I hope that when it comes time to vote on this um, council will hold ourselves to a higher decorum than some others have tonight and that's all and thank you councilman Loscombe do you have any comments or motions yes this is Schumacher um, this was a bad week for me I do have some information I will be gathering for you you asked me last week about uh, reports by zip code uh, I will get that together this week and also I understand that the permits were pulled but I'm still waiting for some more detail on that other issue and I'll be updating you on that too 
Um, again, I wasn't going to get into the discussion on this because everyone knows where I stand. Um, and I agree with, the, with a couple speakers here. I agree with uh, Mr. Figured. This is a polarizing issue. It's very polarizing. We all have independent minds and we look at it in our own ways based on our history, our background, what we see for the future, um, and why we came to our vote. And one of the reasons why I came to the vote is, is from hearing from the HARB panel, but also seeing them in action and, and hearing some of what went on behind the scenes that a lot of people weren't privy to, um, which makes you wonder, was it done right? And I don't believe so. I don't believe they acted in the best, his, the best interest of, of the historical preservation in this city. That's my belief. That's why I vote. That's the only issue I'm looking at at this. As, Mr., as I said, I agree with Mr. Rogan on that. It's one issue. The issue, should we tear down a piece of history? This is a piece of history. First of all, uh, we discussed new buildings versus old. Uh, we discussed the Scranton High School, the old Scranton High School. Look at West Scranton. I mean, these are monuments. Look at North Scranton High School. They're still standing years after they said it was going into the mines. They've all been fixed and rehabbed. Now take example, West Intermediate. I don't believe it was a year after it was built they had to redo the facade on that building. Uh, West Intermediate's floor. How many times have they redone the floor now at expensive cost? Scranton High School. They had a water problem, they've had to do the floors there. And ironically, I just see there, there it's going to be a costly, changing the light bill, uh, it's going to be costly for them to change the lights in the pool area because it wasn't designed for that. They have to build special scaffolding, they have to drain the pool and everything. So newer isn't always better, and newer doesn't hold out as good as better, as, as good as uh, some of the old. Some of the old bones are pretty good. So I had a look at this whole picture with all of this, with jobs and everything. You know, we're very fortunate this year. I believe Geisinger has some pretty big projects coming up that should, should help our labor force here. You know, maybe if that wasn't a, a case, I would have to look a little bit to the other side. But I have to look at the HARB who is there to do their duty and I believe failed to do their duty. I gave them the opportunity to re-vote it. They didn't. I gave our panel here the opportunity to bring this up again before the five of us. Whatever way this vote goes, you know, I have to live with it. That's why I'm here. And we talk about threats and stuff like that. Hell, I read the blogs, the Times website, Times letters to the editor, cartoons, I get bashed quite a bit. You know, the fact is, I may not be the most eloquent city councilman that ever sat here, and I've been blasted about the way I speak many times, but I was born and raised in Scranton. My heart is in Scranton, and what comes from me, not my mouth, is from my heart. And I believe that I'm working for what's in the best interest of all the people in this town. And that's where I vote from. I vote from my mind, my heart, my history in this city, and in this case, the history of this city. And that's, that's where I'm from. But I put everything together again, and, and, and I explain it to you as clearly as I can. So pardon me if I don't have a degree in public speaking. I'm one of you. I'm not a country club member. I don't rub shoulders with them. I don't go to meetings with them. I'm not a politician. I'm just me, Jack. And anybody could approach me anywhere, at any time. I'm not bought and sold. I'm not promised and, and, and do anything. Hell, I've got a lot, a lot of friends that are PO'd at me for this vote. But I've got more people in this city that are taxpayers that have come to me to vote the way I voted and thank me for voting the way I am. Very few, maybe two have said, why don't you let the you do what they're going to do? It's not a matter of letting the you do what they're going to do. It's a matter of preserving history and having a panel that's put in place to preserve that history. 
And uh, as Mr. Spiraglia said, I hadn't thought about it, but I will be reaching out to the other panels too in the future on, on different issues. But uh, I just wanted to explain my vote hasn't changed. Nothing has changed. In fact, it's only been strengthened by some literature that we received in the meantime uh, based on some more history of the Y and the architect, Edward Langley, who had, uh, who had been involved in that in many buildings, the Scranton Life Building, the Globe Store Building, the George Catlin House, Emanuel Baptist Church, Lackawanna Station, at Jefferson Avenue, the YWCA Building, and many more. Yep, people say they're unusable, there's, but look at some of the buildings that we have rehabbed in this town. One after a general alarm fire, the uh, Scranton Dry Goods Building, and that stands today. Again, I personally don't appreciate personal attacks to anybody here. We're here to make our decisions based upon the constituents we represent and feel is in our best interest. We see things differently a lot of times. We don't see eye to eye. And I've stated it many times before. In 34 years, my wife and I don't see eye to eye all the time. But, you know, what we do is, is the best for our children and grandchildren and our family and, and their future. And that's what I believe in. It's one issue. Should this building be torn down? First of all, I don't believe it should be torn down. But secondly, the argument will be there that they voted to tear it down. But I've got some inside information that, and, and, and we even saw it in public here. They're totally divided. And if another person was there, the vote would have gone the other way. I gave them the opportunity to vote. We gave them the opportunity to vote again. Why didn't they vote? I gave this panel the opportunity to vote again. Apparently now it hinges on one vote. And, uh, you know, it's going to be up to Mr. Joyce at this point. But he knows what I feel, what I believe in. You know what I feel and I believe in. But that's where we're at at this point. We have our beliefs for different reasons. I explain mine. And I would appreciate anybody else explaining theirs. And I believe that's all I have this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Councilman Joyce, do you have any comments or motions? Yes, I do. To begin tonight, I'll first address the demolition and courtesy review of Leahy Hall. This situation with the University of Scranton's project has grown to such proportions that it seems to have a life of its own. To be honest, I came to last week's council meeting with the full intention of voting the demolition and courtesy review of Leahy Hall through. After the caucus with HARB, I was very disturbed, however. I was very disturbed by the dissension within the HARB board members, as well as the unorganized fashion in which they conduct their business. During the caucus, Mr. Moore stated, at a May meeting, a true and legal vote was taken, resulting in a four to three vote in favor of demolition and courtesy review. After this, other board members said that they attended a June meeting that Mr. Moore said was canceled and voted again. At this meeting, the vote was against the demolition and courtesy review. At the July meeting, Mr. Moore said the issue would not be revisited and that the original vote for demolition and courtesy review stands. There were so many different stories between the members of the HARB that I asked that the vote last week be tabled so that I could sort everything out and completely analyze the situation at hand. I know that that decision may have upset some people and I apologize for that. However, I needed time to think about what I witnessed between the HARP board members and decide whether the information would be enough to change my vote and deny the demolition and courtesy review of Leahy Hall. Believe me, I spent hours and hours thinking about this, and then it finally hit me. Push all the drama aside and go back to basics. Our interest in HARB's vote was very important, but also clear-cut. Council was expected to vote on adoption of a resolution to accept HARB's recommendation to allow or deny 
demolition and courtesy review. Chairman Moore stated that a legal and lawful vote was taken at their May meeting and that the request for demolition and courtesy review was approved with the 4-3 vote. We have our answer. Some members of HARB were not happy about how the vote was conducted at the May meeting, but council does not have the right or authority to tell the board they have to do it again. During the caucus, I heard the complaints about unanswered emails and unreturned calls, etc. But the bottom line is that these are serious issues for HARB members to address internally. HARB is the caretaker of our historical structures. If they cannot pull themselves together to make decisions, they are the ones who have failed to do their job for Scranton residents, not City Council. In fact, I want to thank Janet Evans for her courtesy and professionalism in allowing the University of Scranton Demolition and Courtesy Review to be allowed back onto the agenda. This does not surprise me, though, because Janet Evans' entire career has been about doing what she thinks is best for everyone and not herself. She is a model public servant. And that's, truly... That's okay, Frank. This really isn't about me. But thank you. Okay. Well, unlike Janet Evans, Mr. Moore did not display the same professionalism. And... He did not allow the reintroduction of the vote for demolition and courtesy review of Leahy Hall. Mr. Moore stated that the original vote stands. With this in mind, this is the recommendation that council has. End of story. So we have a four to three vote by HARB to recommend demolition and courtesy review of Leahy Hall. Other than that, we have pros and cons of the project to consider in a final decision. Before I mention the pros and cons of the project, to briefly speak about the university. First, do I think the University of Scranton should be contributing more to the city in the form of payments in lieu of taxes, known as pilots? Absolutely. I think they could be a better neighbor. They are the premier educational institution in the Northeast, and, well, the Northeast corner of the state, and they could be contributing more to the city. Secondly, do I think the university should drop its lawsuit against the city of Scranton in regards to the parking tax and their case that they do not have to pay? Absolutely. Again, the university is not paying their fair share as other private lot, lot owners are paying. Third, do I think that the university should pay the city the money that they owe for false alarm fees? which is currently $17,000 for 2013, which they refuse to pay. Absolutely. They are failing to do their part to comply with the city ordinance. However, my vote is not about whether or not the university has other issues with the city of Scranton. My vote is in doing what I think is right for the people of the city of Scranton. So why do I favor the project in the first place? First, the university owns Leahy Hall. They're not taking any new property off the existing tax rolls. Second, when the university purchased Leahy Hall, it wasn't listed as a historical building. The argument could be said that perhaps they would have not have bought that particular building had they known it would be restricted for the change they need in the future. Third, I spoke with Mr. Zabowski about why they're planning to demolish the building. First, they did inform me that they, their first intention was to renovate the building, but this was not deemed feasible because the floors in Leahy Hall vary in height and are not conducive to what a physical science facility needs. I can understand that. Secondly, their intention was to build on top of Leahy Hall, their second intention, to construct the the uh, facility that the physical science uh, program needs. However, this was not allowable as determined by the feasibility report. The wood frame cannot structurally support adding floors vertically. Fourth, the university's intention is to build a 111,500 square foot center. 
I asked if this could be done anywhere on campus, anywhere else. The answer was no, it could not be because there's not enough space available in the land that they own, which means that if the site is not built here, it could result in additional tax paying property being purchased by the university and removed from the tax rolls in order to build the center. Fifth, the building brings a state of the art facility to the city of Scranton that will be used to provide the public physical therapy services instead of another out of business sign. Finally, I was assured that the portico of Leahy Hall would be kept to honor the historical value of the building and that a museum area will be constructed in the facility to honor the history of the YWCA, which currently doesn't exist. The vote for this project is about the demolition of a historic building, which is the only con that I see, which in my opinion is outweighed by the pros of the project. It shouldn't be about unions, jobs, or money for licenses and permit fees, but it should be mentioned that these are additional benefits, one-time benefits that will be realized from the project, being the creation of three to 400 jobs and $450,000 in license and permit revenue. In conclusion, there are more benefits for the residents of Scranton associated with the demolition and courtesy review of Leahy Hall than against it. And that's why I'm supporting this project and will cast an affirmative vote. And that's all. Thank you. Mrs. Evans. I, yes. In my motions, I forgot to. Oh. I, I did want to make a motion. Okay. I better pass it out first. I just realized it. As Mr. Joyce had mentioned, uh, in his uh, comments, I would like to make a motion that all invoices billed to date to the University of Scranton for false alarms by the City of Scranton be paid for in full before any permits are issued for work to be performed. And this is specific to the U here, but this applies to all individuals in this city. No fees, no fines, no taxes are to be in arrears before you get permits. And uh, I think we had a zoning board meeting a couple of weeks ago that, that brought up a case uh, of this situation. So just to, to make sure that everything is up to date, I would like to make that motion. Second. On the question? All those, I, go ahead. On the question, um, I, I'm not disagreeing with the motion at all. It's just the first time I'm seeing it. Um, and I don't know if Attorney Hughes knows about the legality of the motion. Well, I think um, if I remember correctly, uh, when a developer, Mr. Jefferson, that was tax failed to pay taxes, um, council held up a state grant. These fees are due the city, just as the taxes were due the city, the school district, and the county. I know that, uh, for example, when rental registration uh, fees fall behind and delinquent garbage taxes houses are going to be leaned or shut down. So uh, I do believe that <coughs> the university <coughs> and uh, any other entity that is owing money to the city of Scranton should be paying what is owed before they are granted permits or rental registration certification or wherever it may be and we've set that precedent already i i certainly agree with with what you're saying what mr Loscom said but i'm just questioning if attaching it to this legislation if this was standalone i would absolutely vote yes it is standing alone it's not standalone it's me <coughs> State, to... stating is there no no permits they have to get a permit there are no permits uh, to be released so this wouldn't be attached to no. legislation? No. Okay. I just, just one brief comment. I, it, it seems as though every week we want to try and find a new, a new hoop for the University of Scranton to jump through. And, is, is paying your bill a hoop? No, but, but it's, 
it's ironic that this comes about as we're having an argument over something else. And um, yes, they should pay if, if the money is owed, but I don't think this is the means to do it. And that's kind of the same point I'm making. It seems this, and I know there's another motion that's going to be made later, um, at least it's in, it's in here that it may be made later. It's obvious after Mr. Joyce speaking that this legislation is going to pass. It seems that with these motions, it's trying to kill it by poison pill. With this one and the one tying it up based on the courts, and, and I firmly agree that if the university's grant and owes the city money, they should pay. But I don't see why we're, we're continuing to tie everything into this issue. That's that's it's, all I, have to say. I believe this is for permits this is this applies to every entity in this city as we stated we're on the issue right now of the university that's why we're presenting it to the university and if, if you were building a house tomorrow and you owed property taxes you couldn't get a permit until you pay those property taxes but your permit doesn't come before us well, mr. Loskin if this was changed to instead of saying University of Scranton for false alarms any entity I would gladly vote yes well, I would agree to that. But right now, this is, this is the permits that are at, at issue right now. I'm just, I'm just very shocked that for individuals <coughs> who claim to be so interested in obtaining permit fees, et cetera, the money coming into the city, you're so willing to overlook the fact that the university owes the city of Scranton for false alarms. I didn't say I was willing to overlook it. I said people, they should pay the money. 16 people I said in an they should pay the money. How am I overlooking it? it? What, when, when they're good and ready? No, I said they should pay. If they owe the city money, they should pay it. Mm -hmm. And I also said if this was changed from being specific, <laughs> University of Scranton, to anyone for false alarms, I would support it. It should be applied across the board. Well, I will make sure, I believe there is an ordinance to that, but I will make sure that that is an ordinance. But for the time being, yeah. right now, this is the ordinance, this is the motion that I am passing. All it those in favor, I'm sorry, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? No. no. The ayes have it and so moved. <clears throat> Good evening. During previous city council meetings, Attorney Hughes offered a brief history of the expansion of the University of Scranton. And tonight, he has agreed to provide a more detailed analysis. Now, <clears throat> some on council may tell you this is a distraction from the issue at hand, when in reality, that is not the purpose of the presentation. The public is owed an accurate account of the university's expansion and its cost to Scranton taxpayers, among other pertinent items of information, particularly since the local newspaper is blatantly biased toward the university and fails to print all facts regarding its development, expansion, and actions against the city and its taxpayers. <clears throat> and of course, that is very understandable because the owners of the newspaper, I believe, sit on their board and have been honored at a lovely dinner in New York City by the University of Scranton to, for their contributions to the university and this city. So certainly their bias is quite understandable. Um, but. On the other hand, we have been told time and time again that the university is the premier economic engine of the city of Scranton, that the city of Scranton could not stand without, financially stand without the contributions of the university. And it is an exemplary educational institution. Uh, we hear that University students invest millions in our city each week. That may be the case, but that report is produced by the University of Scranton. I can say, <clears throat> just very quickly, I'm the mother of four grown children. 
I sent my children to Boston College, Bucknell University, Dickinson College, Elizabethtown College, and I can tell you they didn't have money like that to spend when they were at school. And they worked on work study, and that money was used to help pay their books and fees. And the only purchases they made were in the bookstore because they wanted the paraphernalia, the clothing, etc., that was offered by their universities of which they were so proud. I made purchases there as well because I was very proud to have my children attending and graduating from those prestigious post-secondary institutions. But they received no money from me, and they had no money to be doing business in Boston and Lewisburg and um, uh, Harrisburg. There simply was no money. The money was going to the school for tuition. And believe me, I had large parental contributions, and I had, at one time, three children in college simultaneously. So I have to wonder, you know, are there many people like me who are, and I'm better off than a lot of other people in our city, but are there other middle-income people like me, although I'm no longer middle-income, but at the time I was, who want to give their children the very best education possible, but uh, in doing so, you know, don't have the ability to bankroll them when they go off to college so that they can go shopping and they can eat in every restaurant and go to the movies, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They, I think there's a lot of us that just don't have those funds. Uh, but. Setting all of that aside, um, I, what I'd like to do now is give my time for motions and comments to Solicitor Hughes for this very important presentation, and I'm going to reserve my comments regarding the demolition of Leahy Hall until the seventh order portion of our meeting. Attorney Hughes? Several years, I think, since I've been here from the public uh, regarding the University of Scranton. Um, I'm going to move this over so council and the public can, can see the maps and, and my documents and exhibits. Uh, next step. Unfortunately, on Exhibit 1, the light blue colors cannot be seen too well. Um, but looking at Exhibit 1, that'll be the first thing I'll talk about. As I said, the, univer the University of Scranton wouldn't be what it is today if it were not for the city of Scranton. The city of Scranton really created it, created the blueprint for it, the footprint for it, and created the institutional zone where it is. It all started in 1941, actually December 17th, 1941, when Worthington Scranton, Governor Scranton's father, donated the Scranton estate for one dollar to Bishop Hafey, and that's that area right there. To get oriented on this, this is, Lin this is Mulberry Street going north up to the CMC. Uh, this is McKenna Court. This is Linden Street. Clay Avenue, Webster Avenue. This is what's known as Ridge Row. This area right in here has all been reconfigured over the years. Uh, originally, I remember it as a kid, used to be the Spruce Street Bridge that went over the railroad tracks. Now it goes, now there's a viaduct underneath the railroad tracks. So in going through the deeds, a lot of this area has all been substantially changed. It often happens in development. 
But in 19, December 17, 1941, Worthington Scranton and his wife gave to Bishop Hafey, as trustee, their estate here in downtown Scranton. That was the beginning of the University of Scranton. It was located, I think there was one building on Wyoming Avenue. Um, from 1941 until 1950, actually 1964, I'm not too familiar with what happened there. I was, I was a kid going to Central, then to Penn State. But in 1964, there had to be many, many meetings between representatives of the city of Scranton, the University of Scranton, to set a, a foundation, a footprint, for the University of Scranton to expand. And what happened was the city of Scranton adopted it's called Pennsylvania 108 Urban Redevelopment Plan called the University Plan. And what was agreed to was that the City Planning Commission, the first step in any redevelopment plan is the City's Planning Commission must hire experts to come in, do structural building surveys, develop a plan as to whether an area should be redeveloped. The City Planning Commission hired experts, came in, made a proposal for what was called the University Plan. Uh, went to the Re Scranton Redevelopment Authority for review. I don't know what happened there. All the documents are missing. Um, they no longer exist. It, then the redevelopment plan would have to come to City Council, to the City, for an ordinance, three readings. There has to be a public hearing. And ultimately, the University Plan was adopted. The boundary, the, the maps were not attached to the deed. This was recorded in 1964 in Lackawanna County Record Book 644, page 121, I believe it is. The description for the footprint of the University of Scranton started at the corner of Mulberry Street and Clay Avenue. It came down to McKenna Court, down the, which is right after uh, Monroe Avenue, and it's in between Monroe and Madison. This is Madison. Came down the court, down Linden Street a half a block, continued on the diagonal of Madison, of Madison Avenue by the Scranton Estate, stopped before Ridge Row, came around two properties in this area, went around what's called Platt Avenue, and then up Ridge Row to Webster Avenue, Webster Avenue over to Linden Street, Linden Street down to Clay, and Clay back out. The City of Scranton in an urban redevelopment plan changed the zoning, because this was an R zone. This entire zone was a residential zone. They changed this area to an institutional educational zone provided for the zoning so that buildings could be built, dormitories, class buildings, classrooms, other buildings for educational purposes, set forth the limits of the building, uh, setback requirements, things like this. It was all in, the, all in the plan. The plan was approved by HUD, Housing and Urban Development, in 1974. The funds were provided as follows, 75% from HUD, 12.5% from the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, and 12.5% local funds. Unfortunately, I don't know how many tens of or millions of dollars were invested in this, but the city of Scranton had their contribution, had to be in the millions of dollars because all of the properties in this area, except the Catlin House, and originally the House of Detention that was referred to before, uh, was owned by the county. They were properties not to be acquired. Scranton Redevelopment Authority condemned all of the residences, businesses within this area. They demolished the properties. They had to pay the estimated just compensation. They had to pay tenant relocation, owner relocation. And then they demolished the buildings and gave the University of Scranton a clear site to construct on. 
if it weren't for the university plan, the University of Scranton never could have expanded beyond the Scranton estate because this was a residential zone. They would have had to have variances or have the area rezoned. This was all done by the city and when they adopted the university plan. So that's the footprint. Now the University of Scranton, they've had all this land, you see all these light blue areas all over here. They put a dormitory in this area, which was an R2 zone. They got a use variance, which is outside of the university zone. Use variance is very, very difficult to get. Use variances are often reversed on appeal, but they did get a use variance to construct a dormitory there on that side. And that's in, a, but there's a small area that's just a commercial zone. The rest of it is all residential. Over the years, they've acquired all these other properties, and that's pretty much it for this exhibit. Exhibit one, you can take a closer look at it. You can see how it's expanded and how it's mushroomed out of the area that is originally the, the university district. Um, we then go to this exhibit. This exhibit sets forth in various columns all of the properties acquired by the University of Scranton since 1954 up through 2009. It says the assessed value of all of those properties does not include the Scranton estate or any other properties acquired before between 1941 and 1954. The total value the assessed value for tax purposes, real estate tax purposes, that have been taken off the tax rules is over $20 million of real estate tax. The total assessed value as of this year in real estate taxes in the city of Scranton is 357000 There's over 160 60, I mean, I'm sorry, million, 357 million. There's over 180 million of tax exempt properties. The total assessed value with all nonprofits included is over $550 million. Nonprofits in the city of Scranton have one third of your tax base is exempt. Now, that includes governments includes universities, hospitals, and all other nonprofits. So that one third of the tax base of the city of Scranton right now is tax exempt. Of that one third, the University of Scranton comprises 21% of the tax exempt base of all of those tax exempt properties. These columns starting in 1992, running across here from 1992 over to 2009 show the cumulative effect of the real estate taxes lost to both the city, the county, and the school district. They go from a million dollars a year to two million dollars a year here. The total over that time period is 26 million dollars that has been lost from 19, only from 1992 up to 2009. In the last three years, when you look at what was acquired by the University of Scranton from 2010 to 2012, it was over $5,128,600 of assessed value real estate taken off the tax rolls just in those three years. That, that amounts to a total of $25,411,260 of assessed value lost to the city of Scranton um, on, on a tax basis. The one thing to remember, that's only real estate taxes. In this residential area, every time these residents were condemned by the Scranton Redevelopment Authority and demolished, those people, the city lost earned income tax, all the businesses that were taken, that were put out of business or didn't relocate, 
lost mercantile taxes. So it's far beyond the amount of the real estate, ta just real estate taxes that, that the city has lost. When the city adopted the redevelopment plan in 1964, its population was 111,499 people in the 1960 census. In the last census, it's a little bit over 77,000. So we've lost almost 40,000, well, good 35,000 residents in that time period. So while the University of Scranton, since 1964, has greatly expanded, the city has contracted, its tax base has contracted, the population has contracted, and it's taken over $25 million of real estate taxes off, or assessed value for real estate tax purposes off of the tax rolls. When you look at the budget of the University of Scranton, its budget, and this is right from their 990 tax return filed for the year 2012. They're on a fiscal year basis, June 1st to May 31st. So this was their filing with the Internal Revenue Service as of June 3rd, I'm sorry, as of May 31st of 2012. They had revenue of $212 million. They had expenses of $197 million. They had a profit, although they don't call it a profit because it's a non-profit, of $16 million. That's after their payment of all their expenses, they had $16 million left over. What's really significant about that $16 million is the fact that $5 million of that $16 million comes from just the interest they have and their dividends on their investment portfolio. They get over $5 million a year of interest and dividends on their, on their, on their investments. So that the city of Scranton, while it's losing their tax revenue, the University of Scranton pays the city for the diminution of its tax base, $170,000 a year. When they have a profit of $16 million a year, although they don't like to talk about a profit. All of this can be gathered on a website called GuideStar.com. You can look it up on GuideStar.com. The whole financial structure of the University of Scranton is there. So that right now, from a real estate tax base standpoint, with the $25 million that has been taken off assessed value of real estate, that has reduced the city's tax base since 1954 by 6.5%. As of today, that's 1 16th of the tax base of the city has been taken by the University of Scranton and is now non-taxable. That's the position that the city's in. You look at the budget. I have no idea what the budget of the city of Scranton was in 1964 when the university plan was adopted for that footprint. I have no idea what the University of Scranton's budget was in 1964. I believe they had one classroom. It was a building here that was built before the, before the university plan was adopted. I don't know where they had other classrooms in that area. But their budget today of $212 million is almost, it is 243% higher than the city of Scranton's budget of $81 million. The actual budget that was adopted by council this year was, I think it was $111 million. However, that included $25 million of non-recurring income from bond financing to pay the police and firemen arbitration award. They put that in the budget, even though it's not income. That has to be backed out. 
So when that's backed out, what the city's budget is, is, uh, I know I have it here somewhere, but the city's budget is really $85 million, even though it says it's $111 million in the, in the figure, in the budget figure. So when you look at it, the University of Scranton, well then, in addition, the cooperation with the city, the University of Scranton wanted a campus-like atmosphere. The city came in, they vacated Linden Street from Monroe Avenue all the way up to Webster. They vacated Clay Avenue between Mulberry Street and Linden Street to provide a campus setting so there's no traffic within that area. All of this was done by the city without any request for consideration from the University of Scranton. As to this building, the, this dormitory on the other side, this year, two years ago, the University of Scranton requested the city to convey the air rights so it could be one building instead of two. Mrs. Evans, Mr. Loskin and myself met with Father Pilars. We said we would sell the air rights from a lower limiting elevation starting at the first floor to an upper limiting elevation at the top of the building, which I think is seven stories, which is a, could not be built in a residential zone. It was. We said, we'll sell you the air rights for a quarter of a million dollars. Increase your allocation to the city of Scranton from 170000 a year to $230,000, $220,000 a year over five years. We were told, no, we'll build that building instead of giving the city of Scranton a quarter of a million dollars for the air rights, we'll build it as two buildings. That's why there's two buildings there instead of one unified building. Um, that's pretty much the history, how the University of Scranton, what its footprint was, how the city ended up adopting the university plan, got the money to acquire all of these properties, pay relocation expenses, have them demolished, convey the property in its buildable condition to the University of Scranton to build buildings on at a much lower price than what it cost to acquire them. Um, I don't have the exact figure as to how much the city of Scranton has invested in the university plan. As I said, those records are gone. But that's pretty much the history of the footprint and how it's greatly expanded overwards into all of this entire residential area with parking lots, uh, with, with the dormitory seven stories high in a residential zone. And with this showing the, the economic effect on a reduction in real estate taxes to both the city, the school district, and the county. Um, I didn't have time to update this. That's why it's all verbal. Attorney Hughes, do you have um, any comments regarding <coughs> what, <coughs> what procedures might be followed in um, uh, other municipalities such as Baltimore or Providence, Rhode Island with regard to um, the expansion of their colleges and universities? Providence, Rhode Island was on the verge of bankruptcy. Um, they're in very precarious financial position due to the large amount of tax-exempt properties, mostly Brown University. Uh, Johnson and Wales College, other co I think there's other colleges in that area. Uh, the mayor met with the universities. They've committed sizable payments in lieu of taxes because of the destruction of the tax base that they've had on Providence. The same thing has happened in Baltimore where uh, John Hopkins University, um, John Hopkins Hospital, um, Loyola, University have come in and contributed from almost nothing to, I believe it's over f close to $10 million a year to start with, uh, to help them with their budget. Um, what happened there in Baltimore was that they were going to put a bed tax on each hospital bed to raise revenue, and because of that, 
John Hopkins University and the other hospitals came in and really gave significant increases in their money. But they, they recognize the impact that they've had on the destruction of the tax base and the, the cities today, you know, the, well, they're economically healthy and have money and the cities are in desperate need of money, such as Baltimore, Providence, you could throw Scranton into that, that they recognize their goal or that they recognize what had happened if those cities went bankrupt and they've significantly increased their pilot contributions. I, I don't have the exact figures, but I do know from experience, I do know that uh, both Providence and uh, Baltimore, uh, that the charitable institutions there, the nonprofits have, you know, created, mm -hmm. created or have given substantial contributions. Yeah, I have a bit of information here about um, Baltimore. Um, just one paragraph. Keep in mind also Johns Hopkins already pays almost $10 million a year in taxes and fees to the city. The current energy and telecom taxes, about to be increased as was mentioned above, parking and hotel taxes, and even property taxes on property not used for exempt purposes. We also, that's John Hopkins, indirectly pay property taxes on properties that we rent. We pay rent to the landlords who pay property taxes to the city. One thing that's not shown on exhibit one over here is the subsidy which the city gave the redevelopment authority, the redevelopment authority sold to the University of Stratford. If I may add to that, uh, just a few items. In, in 2009-2010, the university was the re recipient of over $11 million in RACB grants from the state towards the uh, Science Center and the Mulberry Corridor. And right now there's an application for $8 million for the Southside Complex through RACB pending through the county. That's our, our state through the county is, is uh, correct. Supporting and, and eight million for the south side complex is, is on the table right now. and in all these years nothing has been done with it what's that the south side complex no it's a current 2013 application okay so after this that's on a on a website approximately also. 10 year period of nothing having been done now they'll they'll obtain a state grant to for whatever purpose I do know the University's grant says that its campus comprises 54 acres. I don't, I don't know what that is, but it's 54 acres in the hill section of this grant. Uh, I was just looking here. On your 2012 tax return ending uh, May 31st of 2012, they have government grants of $6 million. Investment income of uh, two and a quarter million dollars. And Thank you. Informative. Thank you. Educational and professional presentation. And certainly, <coughs> like to state that if it weren't for the cooperation of the city of Scranton in adopting the university plan, the University of Scranton, as it exists right now, would not exist. The only way that that could have been done is with the city going out and through its agencies, through the Planning Commission, the Scranton Redevelopment Authority, adopting 
an urban redevelopment plan, Pennsylvania 108, for the university plan, giving it a special zoning within that footprint, and a condemning taking all these buildings, paying the owners your estimated just compensation, all the relocation expenses, and creating a suitable building site ready to build, vacating portions of Linden Avenue and um, Clay Avenue. So it was, you know, the city of Scranton has really cooperated you know, in, with the University of Scranton administration going back into the early 60s and putting the university plan together, acquiring the properties and deeding it over to the University of Scranton. Yes, and I think it's, uh, and this is completely unrelated to the issue before council tonight of the demolition of Leahy Hall. That's a, a matter of historical preservation versus um, progress. But <clears throat> I think to put it very simply, it would seem that um, in those early years, um, we could look at the university as a as an infant, a very young child, and the city of Scranton was an adult, a prosperous adult at the time, who nurtured along this infant and young child, helped it grow, um, helped it prosper, and the years passed, and now it is the university that is the prosperous adult. And it is the city who is more like the, the elderly individual on social security and a fixed income who's running out of money for food to eat, um, running out of money to purchase prescription drugs, you know, unable to purchase that supplementary insurance that's going to help you if you're ill and you need to be hospitalized. And the university, as the, as the prosperous adult now, I would think, has the responsibility, the moral responsibility, to help the elder individual who made it possible for them to be and have all that they are today. But that has sadly not been the case. The city has been rebuffed time and time again. The university refuses to pay the parking tax and has sued the city. Um, we see that there are unpaid invoices to the city of Scranton. So how then could anyone even imagine that the university would feel the responsibility to help its host city in terms of pilots. It seems almost preposterous to even ask, even though, <clears throat> as we heard, other cities who were on the verge of bankruptcy were rescued by their large nonprofits who appeared to be able to work out arrangements with those municipal municipalities and were pleased to do so because they wanted those cities to succeed. They did not want them to sink into bankruptcy. And that's it. So Mrs. Ms. Evans, just yes. one thing. I forgot. I did have it, but I, I totally forgot about it. And it comes in with the motion that was previously passed. Um, up through the middle of July this year, that's six and a half months, Scranton Fire Department has had 17 responses to the, to the University of Scranton, including I think there was one where there were 11 or 16 kids in, in the elevator, jammed into the elevator, and it was stuck between floors, so the Scranton Fire Department had to evacuate them. I think it was 11, it couldn't have been 16. You know, other false alarms, other things like, you know, with the alarms going off because toast burned, but all of the fire apparatus has to go out. Right. And, you know, the hook and ladders and everything else, so that that comes to almost a fire response of, of three and a half per month. It's almost not quite one per week, but it's not too far from it. Uh, that is three, uh, 17 over, over six and, and a half months. That's up through the middle of July. 
So that's three, three and a half responses by the police department, per, I mean by the fire department per month. And what would the cost of that be? I think <coughs> 17, and there's a $17,000 bill, uh, there, at least, you know, that might be what it is. Um, and I don't know how many false alarms, but I, did, I didn't have all of the documentation, but mm -hmm. uh, there were false alarms in there. There was some that were so minor. Like I said, the ter toast burning and the fire alarm goes off, well, the fire department goes out. I don't know if they consider that a false alarm, but, you know, when you have, I think one of them, I believe it was 11 students jammed into the elevator and the elevator got stuck between floors. Scranton Fire Department had to be there to evacuate them. Now, that's not a fire, but anyway, that's the fact behind, that's how often the city fire department responds. It's not quite once per week, but it's not too far from it. Thank you. Mrs. Creek? 5B, no business at this time. Sixth order, no business at this time. Seventh order, 7A, for consideration by the Committee on Rules for adoption, file of council number 41, 2013, approving the transfer of a restaurant liquor license currently owned by Great Uncle Peter's LLC, 1582 Newton Ransom Boulevard, Clark Summit, Pennsylvania, 18411, Newton Township, License number R-2782 to Tara Prita, LLC, for use at 222 Wyoming Avenue, Scranton, Pennsylvania, as required by the Pennsylvania Liquor Control Board. As chair for the Committee on Rules, <coughs> I recommend final passage of item 7A. Second. On the question. Roll call, please. Mr. Yes. Mr. Rogan? Yes. Mr. Loscombe? Yes. Mr. Joyce? Yes. Mrs. Evans? Yes. I hereby declare item 7A, <coughs> excuse me, legally and lawfully adopted. 7B, for consideration by the Committee on Finance for adoption, file of council number 42, 2013, authorizing the mayor and other appropriate city officials of the city of Scranton to accept and disperse grant funds from the Pennsylvania Emergency Management Agency Voluntary Fire Company and Volunteer Ambulance Services Grant awarded to the City of Scranton Fire Department. What is the recommendation of the Chair for the Committee on Finance? As Chairperson <coughs> of the Committee on Finance, I recommend final passage of Item 7B. Second. On the question? Roll call, please. Mr. McGough? Yes. Mr. Rogan? Yes. Mr. Laskin? Yes. Mr. Joyce? Yes. Mrs. Evans? Yes, I hereby declare item 7B legally and lawfully adopted. 7C, for consideration by the Committee on Finance for adoption, file of council number 43, 2013, amending file of council number 77, 2012, an ordinance entitled General City Operating Budget 2013 by transferring funds not to exceed $75,000 from account number 014011309042990 Non departmental operating expenses contingency to account number 01040 0004042520 business administration advertising to provide funding for delinquent refuse and rental registration advertising costs. What is the recommendation of the chair <coughs> for the committee on finance? As chairperson for the committee on finance, I recommend final passage of item 7C. Second. On the question? Roll call, please. Mr. McGough? Yes. Mr. Rogan? Yes. Mr. Loscom? Yes. Mr. Joyce? Yes. Mrs. Evans? Yes. I hereby declare item 7C legally and lawfully adopted. 7D, for consideration by the Committee on Community Development for adoption, file of council number 44, 2013, creating and establishing special city account number 02229606, entitled Paving Project Pennsylvania Gaming Act for the receipt and disbursement of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania acting through the Commonwealth Financing Authority for a local share account grant in the amount of $2,044,000 for paving the streets throughout the city of Scranton. What is the recommendation <coughs> of the chairperson for the Committee on Community Development? As chairperson for the Committee on Community Development, I recommend final passage of item 7D. Second. On the question, Did, Roll, oh, oh, I'm, I'm just sorry. Going, uh, I know uh, Mr. Rogan, I believe, asked uh, for a list of streets that were to be paved. Did we receive? Not to my knowledge. Not I as of yet. 
and hopefully yeah, I think as something. as we all said that hopefully the administration and the department head will take council's input as well so there are many streets that we've been getting calls about for for years <laughs> roll call please mr. McGough yes mr. Rogan yes mr. Loscombe yes mr. Joyce yes mrs. Evans yes I hereby declare item 7d legally and lawfully adopted 7e for consideration by the committee on community development for adoption resolution number 34 2013 accepting the recommendation of the historical architecture review board and approving the certificate of appropriateness for quad three group incorporated architects 37 north washington street wilkesburg pennsylvania for masonry reconstruction of the coping stones of 11 dormers and four gable ends restoration of two chimneys Fine Street porch area flashed, reassembled, and repointed. Entire building facade repointed and cleaned. Removal of <coughs> copper gutters and lightning protection during masonry restoration and reinstallation to original locations. Removal and replacement of basement awning type windows and frames with hopper type wood and black aluminum clad windows. Removal of wrought iron snow guards along roof perimeter to be sandblasted and receive new stainless steel pins and black powder coated finish and reinstallation to original location. Diggs Court East Gable Rose Window Masonry Framework Reconstruction, removal of stained glass and reinstallation following masonry restoration. Proposed new construction is limited to a freestanding stone monument sign with bronze plaque. Existing fencing and gates to be repaired and <coughs> refurbished to original condition and support piers repointed at the Albright Memorial Library, 500 Vine Street, Scranton, Pennsylvania. What is the recommendation of the chair for the Committee on Community Development? As chairperson for the Committee on Community Development, I recommend final passage of item 5E. 7E, I apologize. <laughs> Second. On the question, roll call please. Mr. McGough? Yes. Mr. Rogan? Yes. Mr. Loscombe? Yes. Mr. Joyce? Yes. Mrs. Evans? Yes. I hereby declare <coughs> item 7E legally and lawfully adopted. I would like to make a motion to take resolution number 31, 2013 from the table. Second. On the question? Yes. This is the um, Leahy Hall um, harb issue with the University of Scranton. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it and so moved. 7F, for consideration by the Committee on Community Development for adoption, resolution number 31, 2013, previously tabled, accepting the recommendation of the Historical Architecture Review Board and approving the Certificate of Appropriateness for the University of Scranton, 800 Linden Street, Scranton, Pennsylvania, for demolition of Leahy Hall, to include courtesy review by the HARB for public incorporation of the Linden Street Portico, public recognition of the 1907 building via exhibit photo and text, including acknowledgement of the YWCA building and its role in the city at 630 Linden Street and 235 Jefferson Avenue, Scranton, Pennsylvania. I would like to make a motion to amend item 7F per the following. After the now therefore clause, insert the city of Scranton shall not issue the demolition permit for the YWCA building, Leahy Hall, until there, until there is a final non-appealable court order authorizing the zoning variance. We have a motion on the table. Is there a second? I'll second it. On the question? Yes, on the question. Um, <clears throat> again, I, I think this is another attempt to attach a poison pill to this piece of legislation. Non-appealable in a legal sense would mean it would it could go to the Supreme Court. Uh, Attorney Hughes. That would be correct. What would, no. What, here's what would happen. Court of Common Pleas makes a decision. Either party would have 30 days to appeal to the Commonwealth Court. The would go to the Commonwealth Court. Commonwealth Court, from the time they receive it, their scheduling order comes out ordinarily with a briefing schedule, argument, and everything else. I'd say generally 
eight to nine months after the decision from the Court of Common Pleas, if the appeal would be taken. Um, from that decision, there would be 30 days to file a petition for allowance of appeal to the Commonwealth Court of, or to the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania. Uh, there is no automatic right of appeal of the decision. Uh, the Supreme Court would then have to determine uh, whether it would accept the appeal. Once they deny the appeal, that would be the final non-appealable order, assuming that either party would take that appeal from the Court of Common Pleas. Um, whoever would, if, it, if the decision of the zoning board would be overturned by the Court of Common Pleas, um, then it would be whether the, zone, whether the zoning board would take an appeal to the Commonwealth Court. I have no idea what that is, uh, you know, what their position would be. Um, if the Court of Common Pleas would affirm the order of the Scranton Zoning Hearing Board, of course, University of Scranton would take an appeal. So that could probably go out eight or nine months after that. I mean, I don't know when the argument's going to be. I saw something in the paper, it might be in early August. Argument, decision, then 30 days after that, uh, appeal to the Commonwealth Court, assuming the University of Scranton would, would lose their appeal. Uh, the only thing that this amendment would do uh, would make sure that the building is not demolished and there's just a hole in the ground, you know, until there's a final non-appealable order. Uh, so if it would take a year or two, it would be that, that do you want to wait until there is a final non-appealable order so that the buildings will remain in position and not be demolished and have that half a block down to the court and over to the other building, I think it's McGurran Hall, uh, just have that lay fallow for whatever period of time it is. I mean, that's what the issue is on that. Thank you, Attorney Hughes, for the explanation. Um, again, like I said, this if this passes, the non-appealable can be a matter of years. Might as well vote no on the project if you're going to vote yes on this amendment. Um, it would effectively kill the project. Well, that would be assuming that the zoning board would have a budget large enough to sustain a continual appeal process leading all the way to the Supreme Court. And that is contained in the budget, the annual operating budget <clears throat> of the city of Scranton. And they do not have a budget to support such measures. And certainly the last thing that the city or the zoning board needs is another court case that goes to the state Supreme Court. We saw how that played out last time. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? No. no. The no's have it, and it is not amended. What is the recommendation of the chair for the Committee on Community Development? As chairperson for the Committee on Community Development, I recommend final passage of item 7F in Second. order to increase jobs and spur economic development in the city of Scranton. Second. On the question? Yes, on the question. I would just like to make a few comments. Um, and I do appreciate Attorney Hughes' presentation, and I agree with every word he said. But not one of, none of it is relevant to this issue. Um, demolition, harb, historical, none of that was mentioned in the presentation. Um, I, I do think it, it gives a good glimpse of where we are and how we got here, but I don't think in any way it's relevant to this issue. Um, I actually think the argument of the University of Scranton purchasing more land and taking land off the tax rolls, I think a no vote on this legislation, would it would be more likely that that would happen. Um, if the University of Scranton wants to build this building, the best thing for the taxpayers is that they build it on their own property. By voting for this legislation, it does not take one dime of taxable property off the tax rolls. I want that to be very, very clear. As I stated earlier under, under motions, I had a feeling that from what many of the speakers said and from the way the past few weeks have gone, that there would be a lot of distractions. And although I agree everything that Attorney Hughes said is a completely legitimate issue that needs to be discussed in the city. It is not relevant to this vote. 
this vote is about accepting the recommendation from HARB. Whether we should allow the University of Scranton to demolish Leahy Hall and build a $47 million project that will create hundreds of jobs and bring in revenue to the city, or if we want to vote against that. Um, I would like to thank Councilman Joyce for his very thoughtful and very accurate um, description of his thought process, and I agree with pretty much every point he mentioned. And I would also like to thank Councilman McGough for driving uh, home, I think, uh, 11 hours from his vacation to make this project a reality. I'm very proud to cast the yes vote for this. I'm very happy that these jobs will be created, and it's definitely a win for the city of Scranton. Um, I'd like to <clears throat> repeat some of what I said earlier. Edward Langley was a premier architect within the city of Scranton at the turn of the century and beyond. He was the principal architect for the YWCA building, Catlin House, Globe Store, Scranton Life Building, the Scranton Club, and was part of the design team of the Scranton School for the Deaf and Central High School. Mr. Langley was a significant part of Scranton's architectural history. And to minimize his impact on our city clearly would be a mistake. Now, <clears throat> there are other cities who are wrestling with similar issues. According to the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, the Strip District's historic produce terminal has survived a first round before the city's historic review commission intact. In a three to zero vote with one abstention, the commission gave preliminary approval on July 10th to the terminal's nomination as a city historic structure. The decision deals a blow to the plans of the Buncher Company, which wants to demolish 535 feet of the five block long terminal as part of a $400 million residential and office development on the Allegheny Riverfront. If the commission gives final approval to the designation and it's backed by city council, it would make it much harder for Buncher to follow through with its plans. Buncher's vice president of real estate said, if the terminal ends up being designated as a historic structure and the western third can't be demolished, it could possibly kill the entire renovation. <clears throat> In addition, and this is important, this is not a proposed demolition of the entire building. Two thirds of it will remain intact. Thus, in Pittsburgh, where a terminal has not yet even been declared historic, a fight ensues to save that important property, even though two thirds of it will not be demolished. However, in Scranton, some wish to fully demolish a designated historic building rather than renovating the structure and preserving the history of our city. Also, sustainable development is crucial for economic competitiveness. Historic preservation is, in and of itself, sustainable development. Additionally, development without a historic preservation component is not sustainable. According to Donovan Ripkema, author of books and articles on economic and preservation issues relating to rehabilitation, community development, and commercial revitalization. He incidentally received a Master's of Science degree in Historic Preservation at Columbia University. Now, neither the university nor its architects have ever produced documented proof that renovation of the YWCA is impossible and unaffordable and that demolition is the only course of action. We've heard a lot of talk about it and even Councilman Joyce claims he spoke with university representatives who told him, oh yes, that's the way it is. But we've never seen the documentation. And if the problems related to the existing building are so significant, why then has the university used the building for any purpose? 
And how is the university able to claim unaffordability of renovation when its annual profits exceed $16 million? Finally, council received no responses from John Moore, HARB chairman, that were requested during the July 18th public caucus, uh, something that was uh, noticeably absent tonight when the discussions of HARP and the recollections of HARP were discussed. Um, I believe it was Mr. Scartelli voted on that recommendation. Mr. Scartelli, according to the other HARP members, has only attended two meetings since he's been seated on that board. Mr. Scartelli himself admitted that he's done work for the University of Scranton. He's a very well-known local contractor and he receives contracts from them. But he believes, and you and I have to believe now, that he had no conflict of interest in casting that vote. And you know what, ladies and gentlemen, I think I agree with him now because if he had no conflict of interest, then I agree that Mr. McGough and Mr. Rogan have no conflict either. Well, Mr. So, Lostrom also said that he attended the university. Oh, I don't uh, think he did. Not, not through the university. It was a real estate uh, course that was offered outside. If I that was the case, there would be three of us that couldn't vote. And we wouldn't be able to vote on it at all. But it is what it is. It's a shame. It's a great, great loss to the history of this city and the people who live here. And I am very, very sorry to see this happen. Roll call, please. Mr. McGough? Yes. Mr. Rogan? Yes. Mr. Lostom? No. Mr. Joyce? Yes. Mrs. Evans? No. I hereby declare item 7... F. F, thank you. <laughs> Legally and lawfully adopted. If there's no further business, this meeting is adjourned. Today's Outlook. Tonight's forecast. The seven day forecast. The local traffic report is next. Here are the latest traffic conditions for your area.